So to start things off, we thought we'd um, start off with the, the policy that's been developed. And let's see, Jim, you want to run that? You know, I would be happy yeah. to. So we'll, we'll get a little bit into the policy itself. <coughs> um, so the, the whole idea of complete streets is something that's been kind of happening across the country and in Minnesota for a lot of years. And it really kind of came to fruition in 2010 when there was legislation passed that, in a sense, defined what complete streets are, that, um, that and then that MnDOT should take some action to develop a policy, come up with ways of implementing complete streets within the agency. And um, like I say, most of that happened in 2010. And then since then, the policy has been developed and there's been other things going on. So next slide. The, um, so, like I say, this has been going on for a while, and so various aspects of complete streets have been, in a sense, researched, and there's been various benefits that have been identified in complete streets, ranging from improved safety to increased options in terms of how people can get around to um, helping to make communities, um, in a sense, better, more vibrant places so that the quality of life is better, that the economic um, environment is better in a community where there's a complete street. The, um, some of the more recent initiatives since, since 2010, um, part of the process within the state to better define what complete streets are, come up with a policy, and the implementation steps is there was an external advisory committee that was formed in 2010. And this committee was a wide range of, of different groups from cities and counties and local communities to, to active living kind of groups around the state that were involved in looking at what the legislation said, what should we be looking at in terms of developing policies, and they were very instrumental in, in helping MnDOT form the policy that was, actually, that was eventually developed and adopted, and that was actually adopted about a year ago. And that's kind of the image of the policy. And the next slide, we'll get into a little bit more of the guts of what the policy is. <clears throat> and this is kind of the short version of it. Basically, it requires that the principles of complete streets are considered at all phases of planning and project development in the establishment, development, operation, and maintenance of a comprehensive, integrated, and connected multimodal transportation system. This policy is really geared towards state highways. Um, there's other systems of roads in the state, such as what are called state aid county roads, that the policy doesn't really apply to, but it encourages these kinds of principles on these roads. And it, it also has been done to exercise leadership in right, the overall community right. as well. Yeah, and it also encourages local communities to develop complete streets policies of their own and, and develop their own kind of complete streets implementation steps. So basically, trying to get everybody on the same complete streets page and working together as much as we can. Um, and complete streets really is not. I don't think it's really new. It's really kind of an evolution of how we've been doing road planning and design over the years. Um, we've always, to some sense, looked at road design at, from a multimodal standpoint. Maybe different people have different opinions or ideas of how successful we are at it in different places, but it's always been on the radar screen to some form, and in, I think in a lot of places we actually do a pretty good job of it. Um, but this, this is helping to kind of spur the, the evolution of it along. And uh, so part of um, Part of the implementation of this is we've developed a technical memorandum which spells out in a little bit more detail MnDOT's kind of business operations, how we will work in, in, in implementing this policy. Um, there's a work plan that's been developed in terms of what do we need to do in the next three, five years to further implement complete streets within, within MnDOT on state highways. One of the things that's in development is a complete streets guidebook. And this is intended to be a guidebook that's used by folks such as yourself, um, design engineers, planners. When there's a project in a community, this would give good guidance, kind of the state of the practice guidance in complete streets from the planning phase all the way down to operations and maintenance. This is in development. <coughs> um, I think we're looking at sometime in early 2000 to mid 2015 for that guidebook to be finished. Is that, is that about right? That sounds about right. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's some other things going on in, the, in MnDOT, too, to help implement, implement 
complete streets. Um, we're going through a, a re-looking at some of the way that our project scoping happens. That's helping to understand, in a sense, what's going on along the roadway, what the, the purpose and need, or where there's deficiencies, or where there's gaps in systems that might need to be improved across all the different kinds of modal networks out there. <clears throat> and then within the agency itself, there's the, in a sense, these are the people that are really the primary contacts. These are the, the first places to go to where there's any questions. And um, on the planning end, it's Mark Nelson. And on more of the design end, it's Chris Roy. And um, we, we, we work closely with these folks and we're in contact with them on, on various aspects of this. And so, But if you do have questions, concerns, comments, want to get more involved in different ways, we'd be happy to you know, continue to be active and involved with you in, in conjunction with the district. Or, um, you know, these are other folks to contact besides the district to, uh, to uh, you know, move complete streets along in whatever form you feel like you'd like to have things moving. Um, with that, what's next? That is next. Yeah. So I, I, can, I can take over. You want to do this? For a little while. Yeah. Okay. You know, the... Um, do we want to see any questions on the yeah, policy no, or at this point? Thank you. I just, could you restate what um, your comment was about how the program relates to state aid and county roads? Um, yeah. And do you want to take the state aid thing? As <laughs> <laughs> I could. Yeah. You know, we're, we've got all sorts of jurisdictions. You know, we've got MnDOT, so we've got counties, we've got cities. and. You know, MnDOT, we've got 12,000 miles of trunk highway, which includes roads and streets. Uh, but really, the majority of the mileage, I, well, I'm sorry. I guess here's where the hand up occurs. The majority of the mileage of roads and streets in the state occur off that 12,000 mile trunk highway system. It's on the, the county and the city system. Much of the mileage in, in the county and the city system is state aid, as, as you probably know. And they're governed by uh, state aid rules, including uh, street and road design standards that, that are part of the state aid rules. MnDOT's role beside, is really to serve as a, uh, a co-steward of the state aid system. But really, the primary drivers of the state aid rules, the state aid standards, are the counties and, and, and cities themselves. One of the things that we are trying to do as part of you know, what I'm trying to do with design flexibility, what we're trying to do with complete streets, is get the county and city engineering communities to really adopt the same type of flexible design uh, approaches and complete streets approaches that we're trying to be the leaders on um, as, as the state agency. And so we are trying to exercise leadership, but really MnDOT has a fairly limited uh, lim limited influence and, and, and control over the state aid cities and counties and really even over the state aid standards. Uh, our, our, our state aid people, like I say, serve as a steward of those rules and a steward of, of the system, but it's really the counties and cities that drive that. So we're, we're somewhat limited, but we, we do as much as we can from the standpoint of leadership and education. Thank you. Sure, of course. Uh, okay. Jump oh yes, absolutely. Who, who does set those stated um, design standards and rules? Where, where is that? You know, I don't know everything that there is to know about that. For someone like me, it's a mysterious Masonic process that's done <laughs> <laughs> in a room with no mint, with no windows. <laughs> but it is, and and really, the the people that, that that you could get in touch with for more information on that is our state aid for local transportation people. And I can, I can give you some information. We can, we can look up numbers and names. I can, I can give you the people to talk to. And they would be able to enlighten you more on, on the exact nuts and bolts of the process that they go through to adopt those state aid rules. OK, thanks. Just you curious. Yeah. I'm curious, too. <laughs> the thing that I want to talk about, and, and we're going to show a, a, a film first, is really what is Complete Streets? And we get that question a lot. And it's really a very fair question because it's, it's somewhat of a, a new name. But the, the point that I'm going to try to make is that it's, it's a new name for something that's really very old. 
Uh, if you ask me, you know, what is complete streets? And, and there's, you know, there's definitions. You saw the definition up on one of the slides. It's really about making the best use of our public right-of-way, state, city, county right-of-way, uh, for transportation. It's really about, it's about mobility. It's about getting people where they're going safely. And what we're finding out is that it has a lot to do with, uh, with uh, people's health, you know, the active living thing. Uh, it, it's really actually um, pretty profound when you see communities that have done a good job in promoting active living and in making connections multimodal connections, bicycling and walking within their communities, what that can do for health. Uh, I'm probably getting a little ahead of my agenda here, but uh, the city of Albert Lee has, has done an amazing job of that and actually measured life expectancy before and after, and it went up a, a few, a, a few um, years, life expectancy went up in a few years from uh, one number to, to a number that was higher than that, just by making connections, just by connecting trails and connecting sidewalks. It's really very profound. But if you ask me, and, and Greg, you, 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 you did sort of ask the question, how old is complete streets? Um, and I think the answer to that that I would give is how old is civilization? You know, because uh, people getting around by different modes uh, in the public right of way is something that goes back uh, to really the, the, the dawn of civilization. The, um, this is the film, you might remember this if you watch 60 Minutes. This is a film that was taken, it was lost for many years, and it was found. Uh, this is San Francisco, it's Market Street, and you're going northeast on Market Street here. Uh, this film was taken in uh, 1906, and it was recently rediscovered in the last few years. There was an article about it on 60 Minutes. Uh, and the cool thing about it, well, one of the cool things, it's really kind of tragic, but cool in, in, in its own way, is that they've actually done some detective work and found out that this is only four days between be, before the great earthquake of 1906. So much of what you see was laid waste four days after this film was taken. It was mounted on the front of a, of a cable car and it went the length of, of uh, Market Street. And you can see, see how long it is, how long it's gonna take to get through this. But the extraordinary thing about this is I, you know, people ask what is complete streets? And I kind of I kind of say what you see right there on the screen is complete streets. It's people using the public right of way, using the street right of way to get where they're going. And it's a little bit chaotic, but you look at Market Street and you say, I, I would say this is kind of like the, the definition or the engineering definition of complete streets. Pretty much everything that you can imagine, there's a guy carrying some lumber, you know, car, cars here, cars there, uh, people walking, you, you see some horses. It really, complete streets is as old as civilization itself. For thousands of years, the definition of transportation did not include the motor vehicle. It's really, the motor vehicle is really only a very recent development in the history of transportation. And uh, you, know, you see some cars here. What happened over the course of time is that the motor vehicle started to become more prominent. And so of course you have to organize the street differently than you did before. Instead of chaos like you see there, you, you have to start to organize the right of way. You have to start delineating where motor vehicles go and, and creating all sorts of rules and, and laws that, that govern the movement of motor vehicles. Kind of the unfortunate thing that, that happens over the course of time in our industry is that as the motor vehicle becomes more dominant, it starts to take up more and more space and it starts to crowd out other modes. And that happened over the course of time, but really, um, really went into overdrive like uh, in, in the post-war, 1940s, 1950s. And the unfortunate thing that occurs is that not only does the motor vehicle become more prominent, but it does start to squeeze out those, those other modes. Pretty soon, the pedestrians you see all over the street here are on a sidewalk. You know, you get to the 60s and the 70s, and we started to design more and more streets and roads without sidewalks. Uh, because motor vehicle transportation started to become like the only show in town. Uh, even today, if you ask people what amounts to transportation, it's getting in a car and, and driving somewhere. And we as an industry, you know, the road and street design and construction industry, you ask where Complete Streets comes from. It's, it sort of comes from our industries and the general community's recognition that we took a little bit of a wrong turn in making the transportation system in a lot of places a, a motor vehicle only transportation system. Uh, health has suffered, mobility has suffered, safety has suffered. Uh, it's harder to get around if you don't drive. How, what percentage of Minnesotans do not drive or cannot drive? It's higher than you think, it's actually about 40%. So what about those 40%? What do we do as a MnDOT or as a county or a city for those 40%? 
does the transportation system that we've been building, does it make it easier for people to get around or does it make it harder for people to get around? In a lot of cases, especially if you can't drive, it makes it harder for you to get around. We've built these wide thoroughfares that are more difficult to cross. We've built these streets uh, where the curb lines are so close to the right of way that we don't have sufficient sidewalks uh, along the streets and roads. And then there's the matter of safety. Uh, you know, in the last uh, number of years, we've done a really good job of improving safety on the rural highway system. But you know, one of the things that I do in my spare time, I'll have to say it right now, is that uh, besides working in MnDOT in a support role, I also uh, do some volunteer work, sort of, uh, on a national uh, level. Uh, if anybody, if there's any engineering types here that, that know who AASHTO is and uh, have ever heard of the AASHTO Green Book, uh, it's the sort of national guidebook for road and street design in the United States. And I'm the vice chair of the national committee that creates the Green Book. And the, the, the thing, the, the realization that we're coming to nationally is that we need to have a more balanced uh, public right-of-way that allows for uh, not just the motor vehicle, but other modes uh, to be able to, to, for people to get where they're going. What we know now about safety that we didn't always used to know about safety is that the percentage of the public right-of-way that you devote to the motor vehicle has a lot to do with safety. The widths of the streets and the size of the intersections have a lot to do with safety. So the work that, I, that I've done, that I've, we've been doing nationally, recognition of, of the new information that we have about safety and efficiency, we'll be talking about that in a few minutes, but it really has caused a profound shift in the way that we look at things. And so you look at here, you know, you look at San Francisco and you look at all the chaos, uh, the idea is from curb to curb, from building face to building face, what is the most efficient use of that space? And that's really what complete streets, if, if you're talking about what is the execution of complete streets, it's about creating an efficient street, uh, creating a street that's fully functional rather than just partially functional, and creating a street that's safe, safe for all users. Somebody mentioned uh, uh, safe roads to school. A few years ago, I had an opportunity, I was asked to make a presentation because the Safe Routes to School National Conference was held in Minneapolis a few years ago. They asked me to present because of my involvement in that, in that National Green Book effort. And so I said, sure, I will. And the, the, uh, the, the topic of the conversation was supposed to be the standards they are changing. And I'll, I'll get to this in, in, in a little bit, but in researching uh, safe routes to school, and I already knew something about it, but I wanted to know a little bit more before I addressed the group. In researching that, you know, I, I found their mission statement or their vision, uh, probably their vision statement, where they said that their vision you know, their, their end vision is that kids can get to school, they can use the public right of way to get to school, and they can do so comfortably and safely. And I thought, really, that's, you know, that vision is bigger than just kids getting to school. You know, that's a really suitable vision for anybody. Anybody should be able to use, regardless of their ability, regardless of the mode of travel that they choose, anybody should be able to get where they're going uh, without having to get in a motor vehicle, and they should be able to do that um, safely and they should be able to do that comfortably. And I was really kind of, when I, when I found that I was really kind of moved uh, because it's not too much to ask and because of the things that I have known because of my national involvement, and, and I'll talk about some of those things in a moment, uh, that we have the ability today based on what we know, and we know more than we did 10, 15 years ago, uh, to realize that vision, to tame the motor vehicle flow and reserve enough space in the public right-of-way for um, other modes to exist safely and comfortably. We have that within our reach now, and it's just a matter of taking that knowledge, taking what we know, deciding that we're going to do this and, and just doing this. And so that is when I get into some of the engineering stuff, uh, because this is kind of what I think of as being the fun stuff. But any questions about that bigger picture definition and vision of complete streets. Greg, I think you take over now for a short time. Okay. And then we get into the engineering stuff. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. We may not have ever put this on before. <laughs> All systems go? Okay. So, um, some definitions and principles of complete streets. And, you know, 
even though we're talking about Highway 61 and uh, it being a state highway, these really apply to, to all streets. So complete streets basically are the people and place based planning, design, construction, operation, and maintenance of balanced modal networks corridors, road segments, crossings, and interfaces, you know, places like um, transit stops or places like mm -hmm. that. And they serve people of all ages and abilities and the goods that th they may be hauling. And so that people can get to their destinations reasonably safely, efficiently, and comfortably. Kind of <coughs> the things that Jim has been talking about. And being right of way, they also have other functions. There's there's a lot of things buried under streets that we just don't think about. And part of what they do is they, they support uh, the management of stormwater, there's electricity, there's you, you name it, there's a lot of stuff under streets. And we can't forget about the stuff that's kind of out of sight, out of mind um, under streets too. So some of the principles. Um, this might be a little different or a little different kind of an emphasis from the way that we've thought about some of our streets in the past and that we're really looking at complete streets based on them being places and in this case places and communities and as such they support what goes on in the community and they also provide connections both within the community and, and beyond the community for people getting to where they want to go to and uh, the, uh, so, so we talk about context, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in uh, some more slides. One of the key things that, again, that Jim talked about is that they're shared right of way. Um, there's lots of people, lots of activities going on. We're all trying to share the space in the best way that we can. The right size for their environments, and again, this right sizing and sharing is somewhat dependent on the places and how places change from one location to the other along a corridor. Um, one of the, the principles is that people are really the traffic. You know, we tend to think maybe about cars or trucks or buses or whatever as being traffic, but people are really basic traffic when you get right down to it, and that's part of the mindset that we're trying to, to reinforce and create with complete streets. Um, crossings are, are very important. Um, we, we, especially in our industry, we tend to think kind of along the road instead of crossing the road, so we always have to be re reminding ourselves that crossings are an important part of what we do and, and how, how well complete streets work. And then the streets, in a sense, when you drive down the street, it tells you, in a sense, what's expected in, in terms of your behavior. This, that's kind of this self-explaining kind of concept. And, and this, again, is nothing new. I mean, that's the way that we design roads now. We design roads based on an expected speed that we like people to drive and do certain things based on the way it's striped and the way that the traffic islands are located and things like that. Next one. A few more principles. Basically, it's balancing safety and needs of all users. Um, complete streets are based both on data, such as traffic um, volume, such as accident and crash information, but they're also based on goals, community goals, we have state transportation goals that say that we want to be achieving certain things in the state for transportation. Among them are increasing the mode share of biking and walking and things like that. The, um, again, the, the, this balancing happens not just on a specific street, but it happens on parallel streets. It might happen on a parallel shared use path, such as the Gitche Trail. Trying to think of it beyond just the specific street that we might be talking about on a certain project. And then um, using a, a collaborative, kind of a multidisciplinary approach to figuring out what it is that's going on, what it is that we'd like to do to, in a sense, plan and develop a complete street. <clears throat> Again, as I, as I mentioned, this is talking about looking beyond just a specific segment of a road. There's different modal networks. Um, so trying to look at all those different networks, layering them one on top of the other, figuring out where they best work together, or if there's a need for a certain modal network to perform at a higher level on a parallel street or a parallel facility, how do we best balance those things across the different networks. And again, connectivity is, is really why we're here, and connectivity <coughs> happens both across the street and miles down the highway. and so. Trying to again get the 
get the best fit and get the best balance and connectivity at these different scales. <clears throat> uh, another aspect of this is, is the whole idea of crashes and risk. Um, there's, it's, it's become more important, it seems like, and, and more aware recently that there's, there's key relationships between speed and risk. And so Complete Streets is, is diving into a little bit more detail. And for instance, what this diagram shows is the risk of a pedestrian being killed based on how, how fast a car might be going when it, when it would hit a pedestrian. And so basically with Complete Streets, we're trying to reduce risk for everybody. Um, that means managing motor vehicle traffic speeds, which we do. Um, in the complete streets paradigm that we're at now, it might mean that speeds are slightly lower in certain places than we might have typically used in the past. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, and this again shows basically in terms of the risk of a pedestrian fatality, that when you get in this range between 20 and 30 miles an hour, that's kind of the low end of this kind of risk curve. And once you get beyond that, that the risk kind of goes off the charts. And that's part of the reason why you might hear people talking about you know, 25 mile an hour motor vehicle operating speeds or 20 is to try and get at reducing that risk. And there's other curves like this that apply to highways where you're actually traveling faster. I mean, the, the gist of this is that the human body is only able to absorb so much change in force and and it, it applies even at highway speeds when you get over certain points, then the risk of people being injured even inside their cars goes up quite a bit. Next. <clears throat> Intersections, again, I said are very important and there's some principles on this. Um, appropriately slow and for urban situations, I have a few things noted here. Key that you can see each other um, that the crossings are short and direct and that they're as simple as possible and that you show and, and give priority and these are th again things that we do but maybe it's a little refinement of, of how we've done things in the past <clears throat> and then if, if these principles can't be applied for some reason then there's always an option of, of basically building a bridge or doing some kind of what we call a grade separation so that you do separate one kind of traffic from the other. That's probably the extreme end of the range in terms of these kinds of um, complete intersection principles. <clears throat> and the other thing that's, that's important is, is what does complete streets mean from a performance standpoint? And maybe this is actually more important from MnDOT standpoint than from, from others because we're, we're really supposed to be this performance driven agency. But to reduce it to, again, those key categories, safety means that we reduce the crashes and the risk. Um, efficiently means basically you can get as quickly as, as is reasonably possible to your destination and as directly as possible. And then comfortably means that basically the road or the sidewalk that you're traveling on is in, is in good condition, adequate condition for getting around to where you're going in places where um, you may have uh, a, more, a more dense built environment, like maybe downtown here, you think about weather protection along a sidewalk. Um, and then again, getting back to this whole idea of this kind of multifunctional aspect of the streets. There's stormwater aspect, there's trees that make it more inviting environment, um, all those kinds of as aspects of the street that uh, play into this whole kind of comfort factor of complete streets. And so I'll take the mic back, I guess. Any questions on, on those principles? There will be a quiz, no one. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'm gonna, like I promised before, kind of go engineering on you. I'm going to do my best to avoid jargon and stuff like that, but if I fail and, and I say something that uh, people don't understand, please uh, interrupt me. Uh, I, you know, I, I think this works best if it's informal and conversational, so please anybody at any time feel free to interrupt with any questions or, or anything that you want to say, any interjections. Uh, 
that would be just cool. It'd be good to have a conversation. So I just want to talk about the way that um, we design streets and the changes that have occurred in at least the official street design criteria um, in recent years and things that we know now that we haven't necessarily known before and a little bit of, of the evolution. And I'm going to really just talk about two primary elements. There's all sorts of different kinds of elements that could go on, on a street. And you're talking about roadway elements and sidewalk elements, trail elements. Uh, but I want to talk about really two things that drive a lot of the width of the street and the function of the street. And that is the travel lanes and the parking lanes. So I, I'm just going to go through travel lanes and parking lanes. And we'll talk about travel lane width first. You know, the, the ubiquitous travel lane width, for those of you who know uh, much about the way we design roads and streets, is the 12-foot the wide travel lane. It has really, over the last 40 years, uh, been the primary travel lane width that we have used in both our road and our street design. And people think of it as, you know, having come down with Moses from Mount Sinai on one of the tablets. Uh, but really, we didn't start using the travel lane on a, the 12 foot travel lane on a widespread basis until that right there, which is the Pennsylvania Turnpike. They were expecting a lot of traffic, a lot of trucks. They, they wanted to, I mean, it really was the forerunner of the interstate highway system. It was constructed in, in the early 1940s and did serve as a really good template for the interstate. And up to that point, you know, the 11 foot travel lane or even 10 foot or 9 foot travel lanes out in the rural areas were used a lot. Um, but they went, uh, they went to 12, and you, and you can probably, probably recognize it uh, there, you know, the, the proportion of the vehicle widths to the lane widths. That's the 12-foot lane. Uh, we do know that when it comes to rural design, this is a figure from something that we call the, the Highway Safety Manual, which is actually based on real data of what's safe and, and what's less safe. And for a rural highway, and, and you know, you, you look at very carefully, the first word, word up there is rural, for rural high-speed two-lane highways, we do know that the best safety performance is the wider lanes. The 12-foot lane is the safest. 11-foot lane is slightly less safe, and it gets less safe from there. That's for rural highways. And the, the problem with the way that we have come to do things over the years is that we have taken what we know about rural highways and sometimes applied it to situations where those same principles might not um, be true. Uh, this is, this is 1973, that the forerunner to that green book that I talked about was, was the red book, which was the, the ASHO design guide for urban arterial streets. And this really, even though this is 40, 41 years ago, this, what you see there that was written at that time, still to a great extent governs the mindset that street and road designers use <coughs> when designing urban streets. And that was that, well, you know, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. If it's good for rural highways, if it's good for urban freeways, then it's good for arterial streets too, because we want to have, like it says there, capacity and proper operations. It does allow that something a little less than 12 feet wide uh, might be necessary, but it does try to warn you away from it. And they definitely said back in the 1973 Red Book, that any width less than an 11 foot travel lane, uh, just don't even try it because uh, you know, it's gonna be terrible. It's gonna be cats and dogs living together and all that, all that stuff. So that is, again, the mindset that still pervades a lot of the industry that I work in. The problem is it has not turned out to be true. It was based on assumptions and suppositions. It was based on the supposition, the general supposition that more is better that if a little is good, that more is better, the wider is better. And we sort of knew that about rural highways, and we assumed that the same thing was true of, of urban streets. Uh, so we were definitely drinking out of the 12-foot lane trough right there. That's the, that's the expression. <laughs> drinking out of the trough of the 12-foot lane, and, and, and we've done that for, for a long, long time. Like I said, though, the problem is it turned out not to be true. Kind of the breakthrough was uh, it occurred in, in 2007. It was this study. Uh, it was done by really the finest uh, highway and street uh, design research team in the country, Midwest Research in Kansas City. And they decided that they were going to settle it once and for all. Is it really less safe 
to use something less than a 12-foot lane? That was the burning question that a lot of people were asking. So they studied urban streets in three different states. One of them was Minnesota. And they crunched all the numbers. And what they found was that there is no indication that the use of lanes narrower than 12 feet on urban and suburban arterials increase crash frequencies. Uh, they go on to say that in a lot of cases, narrower lanes provide benefits. Things like what you see there, they provide space for other features that enhance safety. And they, and they do help with pedestrian safety by creating a, a narrower street that is easier for pedestrians to cross. So um, there's that, but here's really, here's really the, um, the kicker. Not only did they conclude that lanes less than 12 feet wide were not a safety deficit, they actually concluded that where the results were statistically significant, that narrower lanes were associated with lower crash rates on urban streets rather than higher crash rates. And of course, this was hugely, when this was published, this is hugely disorienting to a street design industry that had been operating based on the principle that wider was better for how many decades? Now all of a sudden we have research, good research, statistically significant results from the best researcher in the industry that, whoa, it's exactly the opposite. That it, every, their, our world was turned upside down. That not only were narrower lanes not less safe, they were actually more safe, at least down to a 10-foot travel lane width. Uh, so lower rather than higher crash frequencies. Has this been generally accepted in the engineering community? Yes and no. It's we're still trying to get better acceptance. It is starting to, what, here's what I call it. I call it the muscle memory. You know, all of us, you know, you're familiar with the muscle memory. You, you, you do things the way that you do them and you're not, sure that, you're not sure why. And even people who have intellectually come to understand these research results still have a hard time designing narrower streets because it disagrees with the muscle memory, if you know what I mean that it's still hard to break away from decades of practice, even if you know better. And so that's the hump right now that we're trying to get over, is not only educating people with this information, but actually getting them to put it into practice, which is a hard thing to do when you've been doing things a certain way for 40 years. I did it this way for a quarter of a century. It's not easy. And what helps, though, is that when you know, working on the national publication like I do, the Ashto Green Book, we found this out in 2007, and then starting with the meeting that we had in 2008 to start to rewrite the fifth edition of the book into the current sixth edition that we published in 2011, we started talking about this seriously. It was, it was almost comical, uh, the discussions that we were having in our group, because we have the muscle memory too, you know? We knew what we needed to do and still had a hard time doing it. But if you look in the criteria that we have in, in the Ashto Green book, um, for collectors and for arterials, urban collectors and urban arterials, it does, and I still think we can be more plain spoken about this, and, I, and we are going to be working on this, but it does tell you that the 12 foot lanes are best for high speed arterials, and that the narrower lanes are better for the low speed arterials. We do need to be more forceful, we do need to be more plain spoken about the way we say it there was only a certain amount of change that we could get away with doing at the time. Uh, but as an industry, we, we just need to get there. But putting it into practice uh, is really the trick, getting people to actually put it into practice, because it is difficult to overcome the muscle memory. What's high speed and low speed? We define high speed as a what we call a design speed, which is the speed that we use to determine the features of the road, which sort of loosely correlates to, uh, to posted speed. But a design speed of 50 or higher is what we consider to be high speed. A design speed of 45 and lower is considered to be a low speed design speed. You bet. Um, so you might say, OK, that was just one study. Interestingly enough, uh, MnDOT, we did a study. The results were published just last year. We did it. Um, um, UW-Madison, again, very good researchers. Uh, and MnDOT and the Minnesota Local Road Research Board, that's what LRRB means. Uh, we did one. To, and and it, was, it was about the state aid thing. It was about maybe providing 
our state aid counties and cities with more comfort to modify their state aid rules in the future. And so it was done largely to minister to our state aid people to give them more comfort. So it was the implications of modifying state aid standards in urban and suburban situations to accommodate very, various roadway users, really in a complete streets agenda here. And it concluded basically the same thing that that 2007 study concluded, and that is narrower cross sections and narrower travel lanes were safer than wider cross sections and wider travel lanes. So that corroborates the 2007 research, and I imagine if more people are continuing to do this research that those research results will continue to corroborate, because when you think about it, it's not actually counterintuitive. The, uh, we do know that the narrower travel lanes, narrower cross sections reduce speeds. And as Greg mentioned, reducing speeds in urban environments uh, makes them more safe, particularly for users other than the motor vehicle users. I have a quick question. You bet. When you say urban, would you consider um, the corridor in Grand Marais? under that definition? I, I think most people here wouldn't think of Cook County as urban. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, urban really does apply to the, the, the small town downtowns. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the same dynamics, really mainly the same dynamics would apply on your downtown streets here as would apply to any similar street in a bigger city. So as far as this, you know, it's, it's always a blurry line, but I would say that Highway 61 in your downtown streets, right there in the urban core, would qualify as urban, and then you get a little further outside that, and we would probably take a suburban design sensibility to that. A lot of those same dynamics apply even in, in, in suburban areas in bigger cities. Uh, when you mentioned going from wider to narrower streets, um, did the accident rate stay the same, or actually get less with the narrower streets? Accident rates declined with the narrower streets and the narrower lane lines. So, then, okay, we knew something about safety. We knew that the narrower cross sections and narrower lanes in towns and cities are more safe. But the continued um, concern by the industry, and it's a valid concern, is that what does this do to the carrying capacity of those streets? Are you able to get fewer vehicles through there? And for the longest time, the Highway Capacity Manual, that's, a, that's the TRB Highway Capacity Manual, for the longest time the Highway Capacity Manual said that for each reduction in lane width of one foot below 12 feet, that you could expect a two or three percent reduction in the carrying capacity of that lane in terms of the vehicular capacity. Uh, so that uh, was something that uh, would have caused people, especially in busier streets, to not want to go to narrower lanes. Uh, that was addressed in the 2010 edition of the Highway Capacity Manual. If you look in the 2010 HCM, what it says is that the uninterrupted, or excuse me, the interrupted flow capacity, pardon me, the interrupted flow capacity of a 10-foot lane, an 11-foot lane, and a 12-foot lane are exactly the same. And what we say when we mean interrupted flow capacity, that would be interrupted by a traffic signal. So the signal lies, and of course, when you have an urban street, the signal, the traffic signal, is the capacity control on that street, the intersection has a lower carrying capacity than the stretches of road up and downstream of it. So the intersection, the signalized, signalization of the intersection itself is the control of the capacity of the street. So uh, it concluded that when it came to the traffic signal capacity of these streets, the 10-foot lane, 11-foot lane, and 12-foot lane were exactly the same as each other. So when you summarize, for small town streets, urban streets, suburban streets, narrow lanes are generally safer. There are a few exceptions but generally the narrower lanes are safer. They're definitely less expensive because it's less pavement. Uh, they provide no less signalized capacity, which is really important. And as important as anything else, they allow more space for other things. Uh, other things being some of these complete streets features that we're talking about, other modes, et cetera, et cetera. So the guidance that we give people for urban suburban streets is to right size the design. And we just tell people it makes sense for Interstate 35 in rural Minnesota to have 12 foot lanes. But it doesn't make sense for an urban street in a small town or a city to have that same lane width. 
It uh, never really has made sense. It's just that we hadn't realized that it didn't make sense until now, until you look at the numbers, the safety numbers and the, and the performance. Uh, same event reforms with lesser widths on urban streets. Yeah. And what we tell people is to err on the size of smaller. If you have a question, smaller is better. Um, when you have a road like Highway 61, yeah. um, that's servicing uh, international trade, yep. and we have things like modular homes and um, windmill stems and gigantic bulldozers, and uh, you know, we really do have some pretty tremendous loads that make their way up Highway 61. What's the effect on a narrower, you know, uh, let's just say at some point in time, a design standard said, well, we, we can go with a 10-foot lane. Uh, what's, what effect is that going to have on that bulldozer on its way up to, you know, Canada? You know, I'm glad you asked because it's exactly what I was just about to say. Oh. That you need to make, <laughs> you need to make the overall roadway wide enough to do the job that it needs to do. Yeah. But we don't want to make it any wider than it needs to be. And that really is the definition of right-sizing the design. What we can do, and, and this is where we get into specific design treatments, but we can keep the lanes themselves narrower, which means even if it's just a stripe on the pavement, does provide a psychological traffic calming effect but we just need to be able to provide enough overall street width that can accommodate all of the oddball things, you know, like the, uh, the huge <coughs> windmill pieces, the ICBMs that are going wherever, the Wienermobile, you know, whatever happens to be <laughs> on the street has to be accommodated. Uh, and that really is part of the definition of complete streets that we don't talk about as much as bikes and pads, yeah. is that we need to accommodate, we need to be freight friendly, we need to accommodate um, all users, which includes uh, the oversized vehicles as well. So a lot of what we can do in urban areas, when we talk about design treatments, is maybe still have a, a narrow stripe to stripe width. Yep. But when you combine that with a bicycle lane and maybe another feature in addition to your parking lane, then you still have enough width out there, assuming that the, you know, that the windmill piece can get through town using the travel lane and the bike lane. Sure. That's the nice effect that, that striping out a bike lane has is that it, uh, it delineates a space for the bikes. It allows you to strike narrower width, which theoretically, statistically, has a positive effect on safety. And it provides a total roadway width that can accommodate the, the ICBMs and the Wienermobiles that has, have to get through town. Okay. But that's where we start to get into specific treatments. Yeah. Um, but generally, the idea of right-sizing the design is uh, just not to, make it, not to make it so narrow that it's dysfunctional but not to make it any wider than it really needs to, to be in order to do the job it has to do. You bet. Parking lane width. Uh, MnDOT recently <coughs> changed our parking lane width standards to reflect the recent change that was made in the 2011 Green Book that I work on in parking lane standards. The Green Book used to say uh, that parking lanes on urban arterials should be 10 to 12 feet wide which when we started to think about it was just outrageous. We revised that to seven to 10 feet, even 10 feet is pretty wide, and I'll show you, wide, and I'll show you some photos. Um, so MnDOT's uh, parking lane width standard now is that same for, for urban arterials like Highway 61, that same seven to 10 foot flexible range that is in the Ashto Green Book. And when, you know, it's funny that our, our Green Book committee, when we looked at that 10 to 12 foot standard, we looked at that and realized Wow, has, how long has it been like that? Because a 12-foot parking lane looks like that. We were joking, you know, we saw some wide parking lanes here on Highway 61. We were, we were, we were thinking you could double park. You could put two vehicles in a 12-foot parking lane. You might not be able to get out, but, um, but I found this on Highway 60 down uh, uh, just east of Mankato, and I just had to get out and, and take a photo of this because, I mean, this is a 12-foot parking lane that the Ashto Green Book might have recommended a couple of years ago. And it's just, uh, it's really just kind of outrageous. Even a 10-foot parking lane on the residential collector that I live in is still an ocean of pavement. Uh, I, I parked my forerunner out a few feet away from the curb in order to be able to take this picture and provide an idea of just really how wide a 10-foot parking lane is. And 
And that's when my wife said, why are you parked so far away from the curve? And I said, honey, I'm making a point about geometric design. Just humor me on this. <laughs> so I did it. So I parked out there and took these photos. And that's 10 feet. That's the state aid standard for the, you know, the, the, the street that was there. That's how it got to be the way it was. Um, I taped out a seven foot parking lane. So out to the end of the tape there, that's what a seven foot parking lane is. So you get an idea of what the MnDOT and Ashto design range is, the flexible design range is for, for parking lane. On a not very busy street, like the street that I live on, having a seven foot parking lane would not be such a bad idea because there's no problem with getting out of your car and doing so in the middle of the travel lane because there's usually nobody there. What we tell people in terms of design is again, right size it, but that seven to 10 foot width, use it to your advantage. If the street is cut hardly any traffic on it, like the one I live on, a seven foot parking lane is sufficient. If you're dealing with Highway 51, Snelling Avenue in St. Paul, where there's a constant flow of traffic and you couldn't get out of your car, uh, except to crawl through the, the sunroof, um, if you didn't have a wider parking lane, you know, heck, use 10 feet. And that provides a nice little buffer then between your parked cars and your travel uh, and, and your traffic stream. But that's one thing that's, you know, the, the flexible design engineer position that they created and put me in. It's geared towards making our standards instead of these one size fits all overly conservative standards to make them variable, to make them flexible, and, and to give us a chance to right size the design um, based on performance, based on what we need, no less than we need, no more than we need, and that's what we need the flexible ranges for. Uh, in, in other words, how busy is the street? So we've got a few project examples. And Greg, do you know what we start with? First, any questions about the geometric design? Derek. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I think one of the things that we've done in the past is incorrectly project future use of the road as far as quantity of vehicles. Now your street, say, when that's put in, when you put the curb and gutter in, storm sewer that goes along with it and utilities, at this point, it's not, doesn't have significant traffic, but if it was projected incorrectly on the average annual daily traffic, that's where you could really get in trouble over designing. But is that better or worse than under designing if the traffic forecast actually came true and now you're stuck there are seven foot lanes and you can't get out because the traffic on that street is significantly more than what it is today. You run the risk of getting me going here. But let me, <laughs> let me say a couple of things. You know, there's, it's hard to get it perfect. It's hard to get a traffic forecast perfect you have to look at sort of the consequences of over-design versus the consequence of under-design. The consequences of under-design is that you're gonna have something that's dysfunctional to any varied degree. It may back up a little bit. Uh, there may be dysfunctionality in it. The consequence of over-design a lot of times, really, I mean, I think you, you see it when we talk about the wider lanes and the wider cross-section. Consequence of over-design if you've got this thing that isn't as safe as it should be. And that is where I ask the question of our designers. Uh, and we've asked this question when it comes to street design, cross-section design, as well as to intersection design. I kind of put it pointedly to them in the Complete Streets class that we just did in May. I said, do we design for safety? Or do we design whatever and then pray for safety? If we're going to design for safety, of course, we have to do our best to get the traffic projection right. But we have to make sure that we don't over-design because over-design has a serious consequence. Serious consequences of over-design is that you end up with something that is much less safe and in a lot of ways much less usable for the non-motorized modes. Uh, we've not done a very good job in the past of recognizing the downsides, the consequences of over-designing. Engineers have a deathly fear of under-design. But we haven't had enough <coughs> of a fear of over-designing uh, because maybe we haven't come to grips or thought much about the consequences of over-designing. It's also easy if I can 
go over here. Can I do that? Mm -hmm. It's also easy to be overly optimistic or is this overly pessimistic about traffic? You look at vehicle miles traveled in the United States and it has done this. And this is about 2007 and 2008 where it actually declined a little and is now leveled off. That doesn't stop the traffic engineers from projecting this. You will still get a travel, even though we can't, we don't even know whether this vehicle miles traveled is ever going to recover. Maybe the world has changed, maybe the country has changed. But you will still get a, tra a traffic forecast of this, using this as a, as a beginning year of your projection. I don't criticize the traffic engineers much because these are weird days, these are new days. Ever since the economy collapsed, and now that transportation patterns are changing, we really don't know. There are going to be places in our community where we should design for this. Suburban communities, new development, where traffic volumes are going to be increasing like this. But there are going to be a lot of other places where they may be doing this or they may be even being going down over the course of time. We still need to really get a grip on traffic, and I'm not sure that we do. And, and that's not a criticism of our traffic engineers. but there are, and, and we see this, there are situations, I think we have to be honest with ourselves in the industry, situations where it's hard to imagine traffic volumes going up, but we still automatically project this. And that's sort of the muscle memory that I'm talking about when it comes to traffic engineering. We have a muscle memory to automatically assume traffic volume increases, and that's not always the way things work out. Please. I was listening to the radio one time when I was traveling down south and there someone was inter interviewing a, a traffic engineer or some highway engineer. I didn't get his title. And they had just about finished a new freeway extension in Dallas, Fort Worth area. Yeah. And the, the man that was interviewing him, well, he was pretty blunt in his questions and he asked the engineer, well, how long do you think this freeway will last now before it becomes congested. <coughs> Literally worthless. You know, like down in the Twin Cities, they're, yeah. they're worthless. And uh, he said 10 years. But of course, like you just said, you don't know. We don't know. Yeah, but if it's possible now, if, if you overbuilt it at that time, say, say you built it for possibly uh, an expansion of traffic in the next 10 years, would that really be detrimental, or would it help traffic flow in the future? And that, that's a reasonable question to ask, and of course every project is different. Let me talk about Duluth. Um, I participated in um, some talks that they've been having at the Duluth MnDOT district office, and, and including you know, community leaders down there, about the can of worms interchange, you know, the, the I-35, 53, 535 interchange. And it was interesting to listen to the anecdotes of the original designers of the can of worms. If you look way back, now you have got me going, if you look way back at the preliminary design documents that were produced in the late 1950s, they actually showed a much less elaborate interchange at that location. But when they got to the early 1970s and re-looked and re-ran the traffic forecasts, they came to the conclusion that those original late 1950s designs were not going to work because traffic was going to do this and we needed to design for that. That was based on the premise that Duluth was going to do this, that the population was going to do this, which is the basic premise that all traffic engineers use. You know, That's why they're popular with, uh, with developers because developers love to hear that stuff. You know? uh, so they ended up designing this interchange and it is it's really, it's, a, it's an over-design for the situation. But it's efficient. It's, I've, I've well, used it many times, and you know, the traffic doesn't, doesn't get congested hardly at all. It doesn't get congested, but here's the downside. Because of all of the things that we tried to do at that interchange, including all the ramps going every which way, we actually have some dysfunctions <coughs> that are associated with short weaving lengths, right entrances, left exits, 
there's actually some things that are worse because we over-designed it, because we tried to do too many things in a, in a short, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a small amount of space. If we would have actually been able to design it for this, we could have made it simpler and more usable and without all that dysfunction and not have to design it for that. So part of it is just understanding your community. There are going to be freeways we design that are going to fill up in 10 years, and there's going to be cans of worms that won't fill up in 50 years. Uh, that's a long answer to the question that you, that, that you asked. I won't ask part two. But, well, <laughs> we, we talk about something called a confidence level. Uh, and traffic engineers, I think, need to get more into this where they ask, what if? You know, what if traffic grows faster than I think it will? Where are the sensitivities? Where is the design going to fail? And then to focus on those areas and say, OK, do we have the ability to fix this if this fails? Do we have we left ourselves some space to expand the street if it doesn't fail? We do that with roundabout design, where we say, OK, we are not going to over-design this roundabout because single-lane roundabouts are easier to use and they're slightly more safe. It's really the general principle that the less you can build, the safer it's going to be. But we design them to be expandable to multiple lane roundabouts in the future when and if the traffic shows up. In a lot of cases, we don't know that the traffic will show up. But if it does, we got it, uh, we got it covered. So that's the type of approach. And, and we run our roundabout designs with what we call a 50% confidence level, which means that uh, you know, we're pretty confident, or an 85% confidence level, which is a more pessimistic traffic. You know, and, and then we run it using the more pessimistic and saying, how does this fail? Where does this fail? In what manner does it fail? And, and let's design it so that we can either address that failure or expand it in the future in order to. And, and that's probably the creative approach that we need to take to street design from now on, is to not design things to fail, but not to automatically over-design things like we always have done. Instead, design it more close to the vest, but allow ourselves the out of maybe expanding it again in the future. That way, we're designing for safety in the interim. And it's the question that I ask people for, um, for complete streets, for, for road and street design. Are we designing for safety, or are we just praying for safety? Hey, Jim. He asked me to ask part B. So OK, part what's part two? <laughs> Thank um, you. It, I don't think I missed it if I did it. Excuse me. But was there any significant safety improvements based off the width of the parking lot? Or was all that data and information you shared having to do with the driving lanes? We don't know about the parking lanes. Because if you're designed for a 10 or 11, we all know, as MnDOT, we talk about traffic calming, we yep. talk about whatever. Can you still get the benefits of the traffic calming from going to a 10 or 11 foot lane, but maybe still leave the little extra? As a highway designer, I don't want to design curb and gutter, storm sewer, and everything, and then that be insufficient. 15 years down the road when that's a 50, 70 year concrete curb and gutter design that might have to move out. So I'm just wondering, is there <clears throat> the flexibility to adjust the striping and doing the traffic calming? As you're saying here, maybe mm -hmm. leave it 10 foot if you ever had to go to wider driving lanes. You don't have to move the curb and gutter out to do so. You can just reduce your, your parking lane. You know, I think that type of thing needs to be thought about. Because you do have to look at what if. You know, the more pessimistic assumption. What if this or what if that? What if we get a, a winter of, of, uh, of 14 and you end up with a curb line that moves in by a few feet? Um, what if, you know? In this situation, and this is where I, I really do think that when it comes to specific design treatments that, that uh, striped bike lanes are beautiful, is that it allows you to go with a narrow lane, it allows you to go with the right-sized parking lane, and it gives you that buffer that in the summertime serves as a bike lane in the wintertime it allows that curb line to move in without squeezing the, 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 the travel lanes. Uh, this, you know, I think, I hate my street. I wish this was a, um, like a five foot bike lane, a 10 foot, two 10 foot travel lanes, a, a four foot bike lane, and a seven foot parking lane. It's the same amount of street, but it is apportioned uh, to, to be a complete street. For everybody at this point. It, then it works for everybody. Yeah. Would people use that bike lane? I'm not sure. But it still serves the purpose. We still we do have a lot of people that bike on the street. Um, whether they used it or not, whether they're out in the lane, it still serves that purpose of delineating, of, of minimizing the travel lane. Statistically, it's a safer street. Uh, you've striped in all that function. You haven't lost anything. And that's, uh, that's a lot of what this complete street stuff is, is, is trying to find those win-wins. 
Now that I've done filibustering. <laughs> Okay, to Zimbroda. Zimbroda. Project examples, a couple of examples here. I'll do Highway 58 and then are you going to do Jordan or David? Are you going to do Jim? Jim? Jordan. I'll do Jordan. Okay. It'll go quick. Yeah. So, like I mentioned before, the city of Zimbroda is a small community in southeast Minnesota, uh, probably about the same size as Grand Marais, maybe slightly, slightly bigger. Um, highway 58 is the state highway that runs through that community. Uh, we just finished doing a corridor study there, finished it up about a year ago. And one of the main reasons why we're talking about this is because this is a good example of where we looked at the corridor as a series of unique places along the highway. And we defined what these places are to help, um, to help form the basis of how the road changes based on how the place changes. Again, it's this idea that it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. I mean, you have rural areas on the edge of town. As you get into town, the, the character and the activities in the town change. As you get into downtown, that's a different kind of a place, and the road should reflect that. And then it kind of transitions the opposite way as you go out of town. Similar to what's happening here on Highway 61 in Grand Marais. You know, as you're further to the west, you, you have that kind of industrial kind of area up there, whatever that's you call that. As you come down the hill, you come down more into the, the downtown Main Street kind of area. As you go further to the east out here, then it kind of transitions a little bit more into a less um, densely populated area with more activities that are set back slightly more from the highway. And then as you get further out beyond where the Gunplant Trail connects in, then you're really transitioning to kind of a different area of the town, a different kind of a feel, different level and mix of activities. So the idea is that in this project, as we define these places, we came up with um, the concepts for the road that reflect a, a best mix of um, lane widths and shoulder widths and parking situations and things like that that reflect these different contact zones and um, provide um, a best kind of balance of activities and, uh, and design for the different things that happen in, in the different zones. And um, so I think if we go to the next slide, we can probably actually get to that a little bit better. Um, and, and in doing that, we basically looked at, like I say again, all the different kinds of um, design elements and, and speed kind of things that go with it. This actually comes out of a, a publication that we use to help guide this process, which is called the ITE Design of Walkable Urban Thoroughfares. And that's a resource that you may want to look at as you're doing your your project and coming up with your ideas for Highway 61. But there's different ways of defining the, the road based on the context. And then based on that, there's different kinds of operational and design characteristics that, uh, that come out of these, these things. And this is some of the guidance that we used in Zimbroda. Next one. Um, again, talking about these zones, so we basically identified four different zones, and this is probably too small to see, but basically in Zimbroda there's this kind of highway interchange zone, which is more of a highway kind of uses um, out on the interchange. As you went north through town, then you go into more of a traditional kind of residential neighborhood, and again the idea is that the way that this road could be designed in the future reflects that this is a different kind of a part of the community with different types and levels of activity going on. As you get into the downtown, such as down here in Grand Marais, again, it's a different kind of an environment. The road um, reflects that, that different kind of environment. And then in this particular situation, as you progress north out of town, it gets into more of a kind of a transition area and there's different options that can be looked at in terms of how the road um, best meets the needs of all the different users as you transition out of town. So I think this idea of breaking things down into these context kind of zones is something that, that we think is really important in MnDOT and we're trying to move this concept forward as much as we can in every project that we do. And it's something that I think uh, would be important to look at in the community here too. <coughs> and then the other part of this is um, in these different zones, again, how do we balance the uh, in 
I mean, what we call the level of service, or how do we balance the, the ability of people to get, to get around to where they want to go to relatively safely and efficiently. Um, this is an example of some of the concepts that we developed in Zambroda for this planning study. And this is one of the intersections in town. And we looked at, this is what's there now. Basically, it's a two-lane roadway with um, shoulders on both sides, sidewalk only on one side of the road. Um, actually similar to some of what we see on Highway 61 um, downtown here. And um, fairly easy movement through the intersection here. The running the issue is really with, with turning at this point. But for the future, um, you know, how could we change this to make it so that it works better for everybody? So again, existing, if you were to look at this from what we call a, a modal level of service um, standpoint in the, in the kind of transportation lingo, we say that it operates adequately for cars, for trucks, and, and for buses, and a level of service C. But, I mean, theoretically, for walking and biking, because you don't have a sidewalk on one side, and there's some other things with the intersection here, it's a level of service D. So it's not as good as, as we might want it to be. If we were to change this, if we were to put a shared use path on this side, make some modifications to the intersection, then again, this is an example. Theoretically, then, we could improve the, the level of service or the, the experience for the walkers or bikers um, with relatively simple changes um, to this kind of a, you know, kind of a scenario in this location. And again, these are the kind of things that we might think about for Highway 61 um, in Grand Marais. Yeah, and just a few words about Jordan. Jordan is not going to be very profound. I was actually, we were actually, pleased when we, I haven't been to Grand Marais since 09, and I think that the way you have the downtown streets configured has changed since then. I was really pleased to see the cross-section that you have with the, the I think 11, I, we, I paced it out as 11-foot lanes, 4-foot bike lane, and 8-foot parking lane, but uh, that was just based on pacing. Uh, so there's nothing that I'm going to show in Jordan that you guys haven't done here. In, in fact, uh, one of the first questions we asked is, what do they need our help with? You know, they, they, they know what's up. Uh, Jordan, if you're familiar with it, there's a US 169 that goes kind of northeast to southwest uh, toward the top of the screen. And Highway 21 comes down with a funky little interchange and down through the downtown uh, area there. The previous condition uh, of Highway 21 through downtown was just simply a three-lane cross-section, one lane in each direction with a common center shared a left turn lane and uh, parking lanes on both sides. Uh, but the, the dimensions of those elements were pretty big. I think the parking lane was eight or nine feet and those travel lanes I think were 13, 14 feet wide, which, which obviously based on what we know about safety isn't as safe as it could or should be. So the occasion to do something about this was a mill and overlay, an overlay of this uh, street and then we get to say, okay, how do we want to stripe it now? So the, the striping scheme that we ended up with, and, and it's probably hard to see this, but we end up with 11-foot through lanes. We have a 12-foot two-way left turn lane in the middle there. Uh, maintain the 8-foot parking lane, or maybe reduce that slightly from 9 to 8. And what we end up with there, then, is a 5-foot bike lane. It was really, this is not unusual in greater Minnesota. You see it all over the place. You've got streets that are as wide as they are. A lot of those street widths go back decades, if not over a hundred years. You know, some of this is just goes back to the to the Wild West when the street was as wide as it was and people were parking their horses on the street. Some of these streets used to have diagonal parking on them. Uh, so the 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 phenomenon of these wide streets in small Minnesota towns is is something that we are going to probably have to deal with over the course of time as we do these mill and overlay jobs. Is with some of these wide expanses of pavement, and this isn't as bad as some others, what do we do with all this space? I mean, I remember driving through Sabika in central Minnesota, and it's like, you can't, I mean, it's foggy, you can't even see from one side of the street to the other. What are we gonna do with all this, all this uh, space in the future? Maybe re-becomes uh, diagonal parking or something like that, who knows? Intersection treatments, we did some of the things that you guys have done uh, downtown with the curb bump outs that minimizes the pedestrian crossing distances. And there's kind of the, uh, the final outcome. So we've gone from you know, uh, this, uh, very wide lanes, to 
reasonably sized lanes. And uh, the space we have left has just been dedicated uh, to a bicycle lane. So I drove down there one day and, and took these photos. And this is a very plain Jane example of retrofitting complete streets elements uh, into an existing curb to curb width. And of course, if it's a, uh, you know, a preservation type project where you're just, you're not moving the curbs, you're just doing an overlay, then this is the, the, the limited scope that you know, we can just uh, uh, deal with the curb to curb width. You have a question? Yeah, does, uh, is this a zero lot line condition or does right away go to building face? And then what, if any, part of the project dealt with the back of curb? Nothing on the project dealt with the back of curb. I'm not exactly sure where the right away line is here. I actually got a couple of pictures of the sidewalk. There it is. There's a sidewalk on one side. I think under an ideal situation where you could do the genie thing and snap your fingers and put the curb lines wherever you wanted them, th I think a better apportionment of space would have been wider sidewalks in an overall narrower street. You know, the street width certainly could have come down, could have gone to narrower lane widths and probably even narrower bike lane widths. But that was just not the scope on this project. Yep. It was just keeping the curbs where they were. Well, that's a question I had, and it's kind of a follow-up on this, back to the study on, um, you know, as the studies are determining that from 12 to 11 to 10 in an urban section doesn't necessarily result in an unsafe condition, or there's no difference, um, you know, the balance becomes still your curb to curb. And at, at some point, I'm wondering if the studies you have you referenced or if there are other studies that look at kind of the totality of the road, which is your 11 foot or 10 foot lane in combination with a four or six foot wide bike lane in combination with the uh, widths of the parking lot as Derek was mentioning, or the parking lot stalls as Derek was mentioning, and then we get to back a curb. And it all to me kind of comes back to one of the first principles you brought, brought up, which is your crossing distance for pedestrians the shorter the better. Mm -hmm. um, obviously bump outs and things like that <coughs> be brought in to shorten those distances, but there's some major maintenance issues, especially in environments like this. Um, and um, anyhow, I mean, it's a complex balance, but I'm wondering if the research has gotten to that point where the recipe of ingredients is starting to tease out more conclusively than just the lanes. The beauty of research is that it creates the need for more research, <laughs> which is why we have full employment in the research industry. <laughs> that, that would be a good study, to, to, look, to look at the totality of it, in it from a complete street standpoint. I think it would be doable. I think you could find... We, we are doing, actually, we are doing a study in MnDOT right now. I'm the project manager for it, in fact. forgot about that one. That, um, <laughs> We are looking at the effects of bike lanes, the, the effects of both the existence of bike lanes as well as the widths of bike lanes in combination with other elements. So that probably fills in a little bit more information once that um, University of Minnesota is doing that for us. Once we get research results from that, that'll fill in another little piece to the puzzle about what it means for bike lanes. There was recently, a, actually just a, a couple months ago, a, a study published um, by a Transportation Research Board about bicycle lane widths. You know, what kind of widths do you really need to have uh, a safety and comfort and, and, and uh, usability? So that's another piece to the puzzle. And you can probably look that one up, and if you want a reference to that study, I could probably send you a link. But, you know, we, we, the research continues to pe put the pieces together, and, and we take those pieces and we put them together the, the best that we can into our policies. But it would be cool, yeah, if somebody could take a little bit more of a comprehensive approach to that. Um. Across the U.S. receiving all protected bike lanes, have, has it been something MnDOT has looked at to do, you're talking about using the space differently, flipping yeah. parking and using parking as the protection? Minneapolis did that. I don't know that uh, we're contemplating that in MnDOT, but it's, it, it's, you know, it's on the table, it's on the menu for us to do in, in the right situation. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different treatments that people have tried around the country. Chicago's doing protected bike lanes with, it, with actually physical, um, physical stuff. Uh, between the bike lanes and the traffic. Uh, sometimes, you know, buffered bike lanes is, is, is something that we've got on the menu where you just have a, a striped buffer between the bike lane and the travel lane or a striped buffer between the parking lane and the bike lane, whatever you think is the bigger hazard. Uh, you're familiar with the NACTA Urban Street Design Guide. Mm -hmm. That's got a lot of cool ideas in it. And, and I'm just curious from the MnDOT perspective if that, you know, you're talking about, you're, we have curb to curb, what do we fill that in with? 
whether, you know, if, not, I'm not saying the, adding just the bike lane is a good <coughs> thing, but what are some different ways to rearrange that might add? I mean, there's obviously complications, but I'd be curious, I'm just curious. Yeah, you know, MnDOT was recently asked by NACDO whether we would endorse their urban street design guide. Mm -hmm. And there were, there are enough little glitches in it that our leadership didn't feel that they could come up with a full-blown endorsement of it, but we gave which I probably you would call an endorsement light, meaning that maybe we didn't say everybody should use every piece of this, but we don't find anything in really in the, in the NACTO street guide that goes against the principles that, that, that we know um, work. So our designers, basically what, what we gave is that we gave our designers uh, the permission to pick up that urban street design guide um, and use it, except uh, in those tiny little glitchy situations where it might conflict with, with other things that we say. So anything that you got in there, I think we should consider it to be on the menu. I can remember going to the University of Minnesota. There, the bicyclists you know, had lanes just on the outside edge of the parking lane. And I shouldn't laugh at this, but <laughs> there was a young man driving a bicycle down the bicycle lane. And I was on a bus. And I happened to be on the right side watching him bicycle alongside the bus. Well. He tried to outrun the bus, and the bus driver wanted to pull over to pick up more passengers. So he actually drove that bicyclist into a parked car and crushed him between the car and the bus. No! Oh, yes. And uh, uh, I think it, you know, there was a little bit of aggressiveness on the, the bicyclist. The bus driver wasn't attentive enough. You know, a lot of things led to this. Yeah. And, and that's, I suppose, an eventual lawsuit. But uh, yeah, so I, I really, like in Grand Marais, I, you know, I used to be a bicyclist. I used to drive back and forth to work every summer for many years. And uh, I admit it, I had some close scrapes. I did. I thought I was going to break both legs one time when someone pulled out in front of me. But the, the thing is, uh, uh, it's, when, when you see, it, you know, see them driving down like this, I think that young man down to you, and of myself, because I've always driven as far over to the right as I could, mm -hmm. and uh, still encountered accidents. And so maybe the idea of having a, a bicycle lane on, on between the sidewalk and the automobiles might be better. I don't know. I, I personally think it's something that we should experiment with. We can, and, and, you know, depending on the situation, mm -hmm. perhaps do. Going back to the NACTO guide, it's created a splash. It really has. Uh, they, they've asked uh, Ashto the Association of the States that publishes the Green Book, whether Ashto would endorse it. And I can't remember what Ashto decided to do, but it's probably very something, something very similar to what MnDOT decided to do. But uh, being I'm on that Green Book committee, they kind of asked me and a few other people to uh, put our heads together. We had a conference call to figure out what we should do about the NACTO guide and what we should do with the NACTO guide. And the thing that we're going to do, my, my, my Green Book committee meeting is actually next week, and we got it on our agenda to talk about, really, in a big picture sense, the future vision of the Green Book. And a lot of that is in light of what NACTO has done with their Urban Street Design Guide. In a lot of ways, they've kind of showed us up. They've, they've done us one better. They have integrated all the modes, similar to what Massachusetts did with the Massachusetts DOT came up with a design manual that integrated all the modes. So instead of what Ashto does with a Green Book that talks about basically motor vehicles and a ped guide and a bike guide, NACTO has got it all together. They've, they've integrated everything into one book, into one cross-section. And it's like, well, why, why wouldn't NACTO do that? Uh, why wouldn't we be more graphical with the way that we display things in the Green Book, uh, the way that they've done? Uh, as one of my Green Book colleagues um, said when the question was posed, he said, you know, we want to be driving the bus. We don't want to get run over by the bus, meaning that Ashto needs to be a leader and an innovator, and the states need to be a leader and an innovator on this, um, rather than <coughs> letting others, because of what society needs, to make us irrelevant. And so we, we need to stay relevant. We need to um, be leaders and innovators. There's the other side of the street, which is a little bit wider. But still, I, I think, uh, you know, long term, when we ever get to the point of reconstructing this through Jordan, and I'm not sure when that would be, if ever, but the curb lines, I think, could easily come in and provide more 
space behind the curb. Another question here. Sure. Um, thank you. When you talk about the series of unique places along the corridor and driving the bus and um, the uniqueness of the, of the community, how do you work with the community to make sure that their special needs are met? You know, for example, the personality of our community is that everybody drives a pickup truck. Right, so we need big parking spaces, or at least that's my muscle reflex yeah, talking. Right. Um, how do you incorporate? You know, like we just went through a, a, a zoning rehab, if you will, a big picture zoning in downtown Grand Marais. How do we um, incorporate? How do you get that information? How do we work together? You know, stormwater management, all those things. What's that process look like? Probably a good question for Derek. Contact me. <laughs> <laughs> it's that easy. Good. Okay. It's that easy, and I can relay, you know, sometimes it's many years before we come back to the community. Um, MnDOT is pushing significantly hard to become more of a project management um, organization, which involves a lot more public involvement. Um, the public involvement's always been there, but we're trying to do more of it at an earlier stage. Before scoping and concepts and everything get developed, so as projects go through, whether it's a project I assign to Andrew or one of his counterparts, um, him and I would be getting out to the community, holding public meetings, um, working with commissioners, uh, city um, business owners. In some kind of format like this, we might not be talking complete streets, we might be talking about here's what we have coming. Any of the information that we could get ahead of time would be beneficial to us, but it's still something that if it's 20 years down the road, we might not remember we got this information from you 20 years ago, so keep it on hand and continue to bring it forward at those public meetings. But That's a question for CJ, too. And really, it's a question that I think we owe you all an answer to in the upcoming weeks, is how are we going to take these ideas and get the information we need from, from you, from ourselves, and turn it into a design? How do we decide? Where do those lines get drawn between this zone and that? Uh, what part of the road are we going to focus our efforts on? We don't know the answers to those. We're not going to know them until we've had a chance to talk to everybody and really give you all a chance to help figure out what are the answers to those. That, like I said in the beginning, there's not a project for on MnDOT's calendar here. This is not, uh, you know, we're getting ready for a reconstruction. There is no reconstruction plan for Highway 61 in Grand Marais, but what we're doing is we're trying to answer these questions and then figure out how to make changes outside of that. Uh, maybe with MnDOT, and certainly with MnDOT, but maybe with some of their funding and, and in their schedule, but also maybe other ways. And so we're going to keep working on that. The one thing to keep in mind as you move forward, remember, in a reconstruction job, if you don't have restricted right away, now you're kind of starting with a clean slate where you can do a lot more of separating different modes of traffic. Um, in an area like this, it would we really want to reconstruct until the, the hydraulic principles and utilities underneath the roadway are completely shot, which when, usually when we design them, we're hoping for 75 plus years out of that system. So, and the time to do it is the time that that reconstruction happens. So if for some reason in the 20s, 2020s, a reconstruction was needed here, that's time to look 70 years in the future on uh, what you may have. And sometimes we get into communities, and I, I apologize with some issues going on this morning. We didn't get here as early to do the field review that uh, Jim and his cohorts did. But if you have businesses that are built right up to the right of way line, as potentially could have been there in that latest example, you don't have the options even on Reconstruct to do the absolute perfect thing without buying all the businesses on one side of the road or buying all the businesses on the other side of the road. And as a small community like this and many of the other ones around the state, that's a major impact if you do that on either side. Um, 
So as you're going through and developing, and Andrew and I are going to continue work with CJ and the city and whoever else is here to try to rein in what's feasible, try to think about short term and long term. I mean, that would be nice that you come up with a solution that works with today's condition. Also, start talking about what the solution might be somewhere down the road. Okay. Not that our our policy and our criteria and everything might not change between now and then, as Jim stated. This is kind of a new concept. It's going to develop just like other developments happen. One thing I would hope is that as we go forward, it doesn't become the the muscle memory that what Jim came up with in 2014 is the way it is 10 years from now. I'm hoping it's better. But at least start thinking about it now, and that's what I, think. I would like to push all communities to start doing. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. I mean, in the Zimbrota study, we basically came up with four different scenarios for the corridor, and they were somewhat based on time frames. What you could do now, very relatively simple and inexpensive kinds of things, moving where the stripes are on the road, doing some minor things with concrete or asphalt to, to change things, but then the the fourth scenario that we came up with was actually one that would be reconstruction happening. <coughs> and in those scenarios, we, in a few places along the corridor, we actually came up with a scenario that narrowed the road in certain locations. In other locations, the road stayed the same width. And so uh, to come up with some scenarios that recognize um, you know, changes over time and phasing, I think, is, is a good idea. So when you say something <coughs> now, would it be relatively easy to um, lower the, I'm not saying these are the answers, but lower the speed limit, put in a couple of crosswalks, and change some of the paint on 61 um, to make it at least easier to cross and lower the speed because we know that's safer? Would that be hard to do through that, the system? That would not be hard to do. And the one thing that if you're looking at getting some potential funding. <coughs> if you think there's something really moving forward, I would want to make sure I bring it to our traffic engineer. So that he's the one that's scheduling restriping of roads. Mm -hmm. um, if the pavement condition is such that we don't need to do a mill and overlay, something to get rid of the existing lines, yeah. we don't want to put real good stripes down that would be real hard to remove without really tearing up the, the pavement surface that's there. As time goes and plows go over these and the environment hits these stripes, they fade, they disappear as we're coming through with the new striping plan would be an ideal time to look at changing lane widths. Um, so if, if this moves forward and something's really potentially going to happen, I want to bring that back to my traffic engineer as soon as possible so that two weeks from now there's not a striping crew up here putting down a long-term striping. Um, right quality product okay. so we would maybe look at the feasibility and the probability of, of something really happening um, doing some latex paint that will last a couple of years versus doing some epoxy which is supposed to be much longer who but has the ultimate uh, decision on that um, like let's say some group decided that they wanted to lower the speed limit coming through the the, the primary corridor of Highway 61, and uh, is, does MnDOT have the ultimate control over that, or does the city have the ultimate control over that, or is it a combination and you need a uh, an agreement between the two of us, or? There, there's many answers to that, depending on to what degree you're talking about. Um, there's a, there's temporary things that we can do to officially change a speed limit, I think legislation is needed if you're gonna reduce it to a, a certain amount. So it's it's a combination of, of MnDOT and by that our traffic engineers, um, our leadership, possibly the community, um, legislation. There, there's many answers to that question. So. What's posted out there right now? Is it 40? 30? 30. 30. Well, 30 through the business area. Yeah. And then there's some 40 zones. 40 is. 40 out here a little bit. This, this, the whole speed thing is a little bit of a chicken and, and the egg 
um, concept. What the traffic engineers will tell you, and they're right about this, is that just putting a different number on a speed limit sign uh, will not slow people down appreciably. In it fact, fire them up. That can cause yeah, that can cause more problems than it solves <coughs> because then you still have a street whose environment is telling you to drive fast, right. and you got a sign that's telling you to drive slow. And some people will drive for the conditions, and some people will try to keep it to the speed limit, and then you get speed differential between different types of traffic, and that could actually lead to safety problems. What they tell us is that when they post a number for a road, it's usually based on a speed study that they conduct, so that the number they put on the sign is consistent with what people naturally drive the facility. And what they tell us design people is that that is their report card on how well we've done a job of designing the street to get that speed outcome. So we should think of speed as being the outcome of a design. If we design it using the right design elements and design it with a, an environment and a feel that makes people go slower <coughs> naturally, then we're going, to have, we're going to be much more successful at posting a lower number and having uh, a, a, a good, safe, uniform uh, traffic flow at that speed. And but so that's really the trick. As Jim mentioned, we used to design our pavements, or I believe our pavements, on a design speed that was higher than a posted speed. Figuring if it's safe at 75 that we designed that, it's definitely going to be safe at 65, but we're posting it at. Um, bigger is better, more is better. Um, the problem is, without having extensive enforcement constantly out on the road, people are going to drive at what they feel comfortable at, mm -hmm. which is like what Jim's alluding to. Mm -hmm. So we might have over-designed your pavement structure, or our geometrics on a pavement in the years past, that is actually causing us trouble today, and now we are more, more on the, the road of designing for the actual posted speed rather than some safer design than that because we can't control. You get on the interstate, um, if people aren't passing at 80, what's going on? And it's because we designed it for 70. Well, and for posted 70, and but... And people are comfortable overdriving the design speed, and that's part of the problem. Right. So through here, if, if it involved reducing the lanes, doing something with a, a bike lane or whether it's a parking lane and the bike lane goes on the other side, all that is traffic calming. You're not really changing a lot other than the perception of the driver, how comfortable they feel driving through this mm -hmm. situation. Um, that's the the biggest way to reduce speed in an area. It's more effective than law enforcement, it's more effective than a, a <coughs> black on white sign is actually the discomfort of the driver. And I, I hate to have to put it in those terms, but it's really the best way to describe it. If people can be made to be uncomfortable, then you're likely to get a, a lower speed out of the situation. Uncomfortable but not unsafe, you know, trying to walk that line between uncomfortable and unsafe. I hesitate to bring this up because this is such wonderful dialogue. We've talked ourselves through the break. We've talked ourselves beyond the break. So what I'm going to suggest is that we take a break for uh, not the 15 minutes we had planned, but I know someone brought some refreshments here. Why don't we just grab that and say, let's, let's uh, continue our conversation at 5 after 3. How's that sound? Very good. We have restrooms outside, there's drinking fountains, we don't have water to drink if you need some, but we do have some refreshments. Please help yourself. Thanks for sticking around and winding out. Okay. So, next on the agenda, we have um, Fleet Street's Opportunities and Constraints, Highway 61 in Grand Marais. And um, I think this is the opportunity to talk more specifically about Grand Marais and the highway, discuss ideas on what, what it's like here and how things could be in the, in the future. Um, 
But I, I think to kick that off, I want to cover a few ideas on complete small city highways. And these, um, these graphics I'm going to talk from um, are you know, conceptual in nature, and, um, but maybe ways to think about how to, how to structure the, uh, how things could happen in the, in the future. The, uh, and, it's, and it's interesting, and I guess being up in, in this part of Minnesota, I think there's a few Scandinavians around here. Right? <laughs> and so this graphic actually comes from Finland, and the next one I'll show actually comes from, um, from Sweden. And some of the stuff is actually, I don't know, it's almost 25 years old when I think about it now. But um, so this, this basically is a way of helping to, in a sense, conceptually diagram out um, how complete streets happen in, in small cities or can happen. And so the idea in this diagram is that there are these different zones. And so, for instance, in Grand Marie up the top of the hill, there's kind of that rural zone. And as you come down the hill, you come into the, more of the main street downtown area, which in this diagram is called the, the marketplace or kind of the downtown area. And then as you progress up 61, uh, towards the Gunflint Trail, you eventually then kind of transition into more of a kind of a rural zone. And the idea in this diagram is that the road design reflects those different kinds of environments or different kinds of contexts and the different activities and the level of activities that are going on. And then the road design is also designed to reflect the desired behavior that happens in those from the standpoint of motorists and from walkers and bikers and the, and the different people in the way that they're getting around. Um, and one of the key things about this is that the, the travel speeds for the, the motor vehicles also change in these different zones. So that as you come into the community, it's 55 or whatever it is, it goes down to 40, goes down to 30 as you get downtown here, similar to what we have now. But what might be slightly different about this is that when you get into the center of the town, that the desired motor vehicle operating speed is somewhere in the range of 25 to 20 miles an hour. And that kind of relates back to that risk chart that I showed you earlier, where if the, the probability of a pedestrian fatality really starts to rise exponentially once you kind of get beyond that 25 to 30 mile an hour range. That doesn't mean that if somebody gets hit by a car that's going 20 that they don't die. I mean, people do get seriously injured at that speed. But the relative risks um, are, are related to those operating speeds. <clears throat> um, and then the next slide, I've got it set on. Oh, sorry. Hmm. There we go. Yes. A little sluggish. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so this this is a little bit different diagram of the same idea. And this talks about some of the design elements that reflect that, that kind of concept. So that as you're coming in from the rural area, you have these different design elements along the roadway in the small city that in a sense direct and are trying to reinforce the desired behavior of the traffic in the community, both the motor vehicle traffic and the cyclists and the pedestrians and everybody's involved. And these are ideas of, of the way that these different design elements can be arranged and running through these quickly. So what happens is the first thing that you have is what they call a pre-warning. So this is basically the sign that says you're getting close to Grand Marais. You know, kind of be aware of it. There's things that are gonna happen ahead. You're coming into, into a community. Not very much different than, than how we sign things now. Um, the second element here is what's called a gate. And in a sense, this isn't really too much different than what's out there now. Um, I know coming in from the community from the west, there's the Welcome to Grand Marais kind of sign there with the funky rock kind of thing. That's a good example of a gate. Typically, gates are placed at the entrance to where you want to slow the traffic down some or where the traffic is starting to slow down. And a gate is actually usually in the, in the transition to the slower traffic areas. And it's often right next to the roadway, so it really is the place that makes you aware that this is a different area, you need to slow down, and you're actually entering into a new, a new part of the community. And then there's different kinds of elements um, as you move through the, the more urban core of the community that help to, in a sense, reinforce the kind of driver behavior that you're looking for. Um, and, and some of these are things like median islands and 
uh, roundabout, which I don't know if roundabout would necessarily be appropriate in in this section of highway, but it's it's one of the options that's kind of in the toolkit of design elements that we use. Thanks. And here's some examples of some of these things. And <clears throat> so this is a pre-warning. In, in this case, it's a fairly big sign that tells you that up ahead that the road is changing. There's actually a kind of a slight shift in the alignment of the road here that you have to be aware of coming up ahead. Um, here's some examples of some gates. And of course, there's the example in Grand Marais. Um, example again of some design elements, a uh, pedestrian refuge island, a median kind of a situation. And then this is what's called staggering, where you actually do change the alignment of the road slightly. And again, these are ideas. I'm not necessarily saying that we should be doing these in Grand Marais, but it's kind of some of the elements in the toolkit that uh, fit with that concept of kind of reinforcing desired driver behavior in this kind of small city um, situations. And then the other aspect of this is the whole aspect of the multifunctional use of the right-of-way. We have stormwater, we have utilities, we have places that people want to be hanging out, you know, having coffee at the local cafe or whatever they're doing. And so there's aspects of greenery and other things that are the multifunctional aspects of the right-of-way that we don't necessarily talk so much about this in complete streets, but it's a really important aspect of it, especially when we're near in the urbanized areas and especially in places like the kind of the downtown core of places like Grand Marais. And then last but not least, I mean, we've got a beautiful day today, although, you know, I mean, I guess it was what, 40 degrees up the, sh up the Gunflint Trail last night some places. I don't know if it snowed or not. <laughs> we won't even say that word, right? But um, we do have winter here, right? And um, I think sometimes we tend to forget about that, or maybe our brain's going dumb from the winter or something. <laughs> but um, operation and maintenance um, and how we deal with this in the winter is very important. Um, and there's, there's aspects about this, that, <coughs> there's lots of aspects about this that we could get into, and that we won't get into it in too much detail, at least right in this slide. But, um, but it's reality. It's reality, yeah, as much as we want to face it or not. And break. Break. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so, how do you you want to how do you want to do discussion on? Uh, well, I I did share two thoughts um, about this next step. Uh, first, I don't want people's expectations to be that we're going to create a design here today. We're a long ways from being able to do that. Uh, but I do think it's interesting to take some of the things that we've learned and to start to place them in our context. And so that in this next step, um, while we're going through it, just know if this is your one and only chance that you think you're going to have to provide input, we'll, we'll take it. But we're going to try our best to make sure you have a lot more chances to provide input. This, this is kind of a pre-design session to get everybody thinking about what we're doing rather than actually starting the design. But we do have some, some time on the, on the agenda to move here and, and I think maybe start to practice using some of the things that, that we've been learning about, which uh, I'm looking forward to. So uh, I would hand it right back to you. So CJ, is there a I question? Just a quick question on the complete small city highways. Is that a, uh, is that a component of the MnDOT's complete streets um, program or what is it uh, the set of principles that you've developed is it accessible is it information that my dad is putting out on how you deal with highways in those conditions or um, and I guess the follow up is on it is do you provide that information to practitioners and how does it get applied I mean, how is that information other than this meeting that you can distribute it Let's see now. I think there's a few questions in there and I'll try to remember them <laughs> uh, I, I think this, this whole idea of complete small city highways is a component of the Minyak Complete Streets initiatives. It's one that is really, I think, kind of kind of developing at this point. I don't know that we've kind of like developed kind of like a formal kind of like a program or set of principles. I mean, in a sense, we're this is kind of starting to roll some of this out. Um, No, it's it's really it's it's, uh, it's as I understand it, it's really just kind of the concept within the concept. 
But another yeah. one would be completely other stuff. Yeah. Where we design intersections the same way that we've been talking about cross sections between them. But the information that we're talking about here and other information I mean, that's readily available, you know, we, if we don't leave the actual uh, PowerPoint presentations, we can get that to you. And I mean, we have tons of resources, both international and other states, and some from Minnesota on small city highways that we can uh, we can share and work with with folks. Thanks. Thanks. Are we done? <laughs> or are you guys going to do the, the, the 245 time? Is that, is that not quite the What's that? Well, we kind of covered it that, that there is nothing programmed um, at this time. We are programmed out through 2019 okay. and have projects identified. Um, depending on what kind of things come out, what kind of options there are here. A reconstruction was needed that would potentially push this out significantly longer. There may need to be a preservation project between now and a reconstruct, depending on funding, depending on other needs around our district and the state. But um, 2020, I kind of got a <coughs> cursory look at the projects that are scheduled for 2020. Chunk I-61 through Grand Marais not on that on that list either. So, back in six years out at least, um, I haven't looked at the pavement ride numbers out here. Um, for those of you who don't know, which might be a significant portion of you, uh, MnDOT bases <coughs> our project needs off of our ride, how the road feels to the user. And there's an international roughness index that's used throughout the country, which is basically how many vertical inches there's movement in a uh, laser in our van um, per mile, and that's rated. Well, MnDOT is does goes one step beyond that. <coughs> we look at. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> We did some research and we had the, the van that does this rating go out directly behind. Um, people had some training in how to identify it, how they feel the ride is. So we correlate that on a one through five basis for our ride quality index. And that's what we drive our pavement projects based off of. Um, so that gets done every year it gets done on the county <coughs> and local systems every other year. Um, but this that gives us this list of projects that have uh, anything below a 2.0 in our, our non-NHS systems. That's kind of the, the threshold and 2.5 or 3 based off the interstate or uh, NHS system. There's more needs out there than there is funding. So we have this very elaborate um, computer program that takes all the district needs, all the funding for the next how many years. It gives out some kind of recommended fix. Then we do some engineering to it, and there's way more need than there is funding. So until something comes about, I know nobody wants more taxes. Nobody wants to pay more fees or more fines or whatever. Um, Something's going to have to change sometime between now and sometime in the future for our road conditions to really take a major leap into the, the positive category. So as you're looking at this and expecting things from MnDOT in this little section, continue to communicate with me, um, whether it's a city or whether it's the county. Um, and I can continue to let you know where things sit, where this might be projected as it goes by an annual basis and I, I came up and reported to the commissioners earlier this spring and we do that on, a, on an annual basis of what our immediate future jobs are and then as far out as we programmed and I believe I only went out through fiscal year 18 
um, when I was here last time. So next year I'll probably present what our 19 projected projects are. And when I'm presenting to the county, I'm talking about the whole county, Cook County, not just uh, Grand Marais itself. But um, the city engineer, or the county engineer, is usually here. Um, so I'll continue to communicate there. Uh, uh, try to keep the city as informed as I can um, at future projects. But as of right now, I have nothing to report as far as timing. Do all the districts use the same formulas to do their prioritization? Yes. And has there been any discussion about changing that to accommodate this type of thinking? Or has it always been when a priority project arises then we're going to apply this? This should be applied anytime we have a project. Anytime we're coming through, we're supposed to consider complete streets, whether it's a matter of just restriping, whether it's a matter of reconstruction. That's something as project managers we're supposed to um, look at on a project by project basis. I'm wondering how it fits into MnDOT's prioritization, however. Like, it, like how, how uncomplete a street is. is right. Yeah. There, no, that's where there's those other grants that are potential, the Safe Routes to School. Brian Anderson's more willing to work with. Yeah, the Brian's city been on, talking to us about on what like some of those are. There used to be some Sims grants last year. This year, it sounds like there isn't. <clears throat> Maybe there'll be some more in the future. Um, the Sims grants are kind of more of a where this would fit really nice because it's a connectivity type thing that's state grant money that goes out to local partners to do some of these things. But that program's not active for the following year, and I don't know what the future of that program is going to be, but um, those are some routes that you guys can potentially tap into to do some things. It would not expedite our highway project. If, if you guys, well, we really need a sidewalk here, we really need a bike trail here, <coughs> that won't push this section of Trunk Highway 61 over something that's got a, a sailing ride for the, the motorists. But it could enhance the project that it's already. The scope, yeah. yes. So once we do it, that's where we start, when I'm talking about scoping a project, we talk about what's in and what's out. Um, the pavement need might be just a thin mill and overlay. But when we look at it, we start looking at, that's where we look at complete streets and we look at some other, look at some other things to see if we're gonna add those into this project. If there's a way to do it with the amount of, Everything we add to one job takes away from another job. Um, typically, I say we have about a dozen projects a year within our district. Um, that kind of fluctuates from 10 to 18 maybe, um, but usually about a dozen. And as they all, they all have this original estimate and inflation's added in there and some risk is added in there, but the more we, what we call scope creep, the more things we add to every project takes away from another project or completely removes a project because it's not like, okay, this is what our needs are so we get a little more funding for it. You know, the funding's there. So as we go through, before we put this in a step, we try to scope it really well and that's where we come out, work at the county, the city, have public meetings with the residents and business owners to try to identify what some of the needs are based off what you that live here and work here see as, as needs. And we want to make sure that Andrew and I, we incorporate that into our decision making and, and the future design of that highway, so. Um, it seems like any, you know, real significant uh, changes like <coughs> bump outs or narrowing streets or something is a really long range project. Um, but we definitely have some safety issues that are, have been with us for decades, forever. And uh, we have dangerous crosswalks. We have crosswalks that people don't know if they've been abandoned because you can see the old crosswalk and there's a new crosswalk over here. Um, we're, we're utilizing these uh, signs that's, you know, that say don't you know, or car traffic must stop for pedestrians, but people think that the sign designates the fact that there's a crosswalk there. So people cross at the signs, and the traffic doesn't know whether to start or stop. 
<clears throat> are there any new products or any new uh, crosswalks that are maybe perhaps more visible on the road surface that we could just start with something small to, to get you know people from one side of the road to the other uh, more, more safely? There are different treatments. Derek, you probably, you, you, you and your folks are probably familiar with it. <coughs> there, there's, there's many treatments. Mm -hmm. um, you can have an informal crosswalk all the way to a change in elevation for pedestrians <coughs> to go over or under. Yep. And, and a lot of things in between there. Our, our traffic engineer would be the one that would more appropriately be able to look at what some of the options are based off of the, what we have out here. Yeah. Um, and if that came through the city with a request or a question, um, I can forward that on to our traffic engineer to see what options there are based off of what's out here. I can say that we've gone through that exercise numerous times in the past dozen years. I can also say that we absolutely intend to have the MnDOT's traffic engineer involved in this project. Right. And then I would add to that thirdly, that I'd love for the design, um, it, we want the design to be a comprehensive design, but when it comes to actually implementing it, I would like to see an ability to implement smaller pieces of it yes. as, <coughs> as we're able to, rather than trying to just build the whole thing at once when it goes through a long-term funding cycle. And so I could imagine uh, you know, a crossing being picked as this is a high priority and we're gonna get this whole thing fixed. But one of the big takeaways I get from the earlier discussion this afternoon is that, you know, paint can be a good psychological um, tool, but that if there's a structural issue that makes people think they can drive faster than we would want them to, they're gonna do that. And I, I think, you know, we're gonna have to be pretty thorough when we look at it, you know, identify a problem area with some different ideas on how we might be able to address it. So is how fast people are driving, is that part of that situation? or is It's it a big part of that uh, situation. And people are driving? Too They're driving too fast, okay. particularly at night. Um, there's, uh, the truckers don't think that the speed limit applies at night, in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the winter, uh, there's a lot of walking that gets done on the highway because, you know, oftentimes there isn't a cleared path for three or four days after snow other than Highway 61. <clears throat> so uh, it's dark, the trucks are going 50 because they're revving up to make it up the hill. Um, but, you know, I know that, oh God, I'm not recommending this. <laughs> <laughs> the, the rumble strips were designed, you know, when they do a rumble stripe, so that, that there's a real prominent vertical line that shows up in the, uh, you know, in the headlights, much brighter than, than say, uh, you know, just a piece of, or just, just a crosswalk hatching on the ground. Is there some morph, uh, like, a slightly raised pavement or something with a crosswalk that would A, intimidate people into slowing down, and B, also <laughs> identify the, uh, the crosswalk itself, you know, in a more kind of in your face sort of a way where, where it's really, a, it, it's, it's actually a thing rather than just on the I saw something in Japan where they put a decal out on the road that made it look like a hole in the road. <laughs> that's, probably too, that's probably going too far. Giant pothole. Yeah. And yeah, we don't need those here. We got, we got the real drive yeah. yeah. there's, there's, there's all kinds of design options, and part of it is managing the speed before they get to the crosswalk, too. And I guess one of the questions I think that, I don't know if there's any data out there, is do we actually know how fast people are driving? Too fast. Okay, but has there has there actually been any speed data collected? Maybe I, I don't know that. Yeah. Would would Mindan I mean, have done that? Do you do that in places? We have done that in places. Okay. And I, I say that with a little bit of um, caution because the way that we have often done speed related studies in the past. Um, maybe isn't consistent kind of with the involving kind of complete street stuff. So, like for instance, in the Zimbrota project that was 
talking about, um, I went out and shot speed data to find out how fast people were actually driving, and then tried to correlate that back to the different zones to the, the speeds that we wanted people to drive at. And the feedback from the community was that people drive way too fast through downtown Sorota. Well, when I actually went out and shot the, the data and got the data, it's, they actually don't drive much faster than the posted speed limit. Um, so having some good data will help understand what's going on. It doesn't mean that people don't drive fast at other times of the day or night, mm -hmm. but uh, to have some, some basis for understanding what's going on will help. We do have a speed sign. I wonder what data yeah. it's collecting. Well, and when we <coughs> got the permission to get this speed sign installed, didn't MnDOT come out and do some kind of data collection prior to that? I, I'm not I sure. Thought, I thought they did. They probably did. Yeah. Uh, I can verify that. It wasn't the one in charge of it. Right. Um, and so like I was showing on that one slide, that those, there's all those design elements that could be included to help manage you know, driver behavior and speed and all that stuff. And so but what we found in Zimbrota, at least to start, was because people were driving approximately the speed limit, at least in the downtown area, that we didn't recommend any of those kinds of design elements, at least in the short term but the recommendation is to monitor the speeds and if speeds would rise to a point where they were unacceptable based on the, the target operating speed that we, we were shooting for, then take a look at some of those design elements to try and manage the driver behavior. And, and a lot of times there's perceived <coughs> lack of safety or <coughs> increased accidents and, and we as not only the district but the state, we get we get safety money, and when there is a proven safety issue, we can get special funding to do a job that would improve safety, whether it involves highway pavement or not. Um, the one thing we do is, I mean, they can go right on there, they can click on a spot, and bring up all reported incidents and accidents in an area, and. The one thing I could do is I could ask our traffic engineer to take a look at Grand Marais and see if there's an area that has significant accident reports. And of course, going in the ditch doesn't get reported a lot of time. It, it's more it's more car on car, car on pedestrian. So um, if you know there is an issue, not just a perceived issue, if there really is an issue, that's something that we could potentially, I can go back with and see if there is a safety issue that possibly could expedite some kind of safety issue. It's really hard to, I mean, I don't have data, but like at the intersection of the Old Gunflint Trail, 5th and Highway 61, there are one, two, three, four, five, six driveways within 100 feet of that intersection. There are two four. restaurants, a school, three restaurants, a school. I mean, there's all this stuff happening there. I don't know if there have been accidents there, but, and I know everybody says this, but there's gonna be one. The other really bad one is right by Java Moose. What are the consequences or the pros and cons, like by Java Moose, for example, if we um, put in a paint, paint a crosswalk where it's not, you know, we don't have, a, it's not sidewalk to sidewalk, it's not handicap accessible, um, but we paint a crosswalk and put a couple of orange flag baskets on each side and one of our signs that say must stop for crosswalks, is that gonna create more safety issues? Would that resolve any safety issues? It would, would, create, would it be a lot? It's, it's not if you're crosswalk. The more you overutilize any technique, the more numb people are gonna be come to it. Okay. Um, you can do these flashing lights. If it's flashing all the time, people ignore them. If they're pedestrian activated, they have a better effect on the trap because all of a sudden it starts blinking right. and it draws your attention to it better. There's, there's, there's a lot of techniques that have been done in the past that continue to evolve and become better. Um, most of those are significantly high in cost and high in maintenance. But if there is an issue, those are things that can be explored. Because we don't have enough crosswalks, but people cross there anyway. You know, they're going to cross there whether there's a crosswalk there or not. 
Well, so we only here. have like a couple in our whole town. You're yeah. talking about a marked crosswalk. A marked crosswalk, yeah. yeah. But the we, have, we have had those conversations with Brian Anderson when we've been out to walk you know, the city. And it, it is a, a significant issue because we don't have this grid pattern of streets in the downtown area where you have an intersection on one side and an intersection on the other side with a, you know, they're well, they're, well, they're, Some of them. they're, in, they're inconsistent and we have crossings in one location, but we might not have another one for three blocks down and it creates a, a serious safety problem and, and people do cross. I mean, they're still going to try to get across, but I mean, the other thing that we have to deal with is that the highway doesn't really change in its width from its 55 mile an hour configuration outside the city to the area where it runs into 30 mile an hour. And you, you don't get any of this effect of calming the traffic down because the, the road is still just as wide. When you talked about earlier, the perception is, is you can drive that section of road just as fast as you could drive the 55 mile section of road because it's just as wide. There seems to be plenty of room. Traffic can run through there. But when you talk about pedestrians, you don't have pedestrians out on the highway. You have pedestrians in the city and we need crosswalks. We need ways to get people across that. You know? There's new legislation requirements now for any time we touch a pavement surface within an urban section for ADA. So anywhere that has ramps or ramps that are either deficient or ramps that aren't existing, we need to include that into our project. That over the last couple of years has pushed many projects further down the road because designing a mill and overlay is, is pretty simple through there, but when you start adding the ADA requirements and, and all that kind of stuff, it, it adds a significant cost and significant design time. So anytime from here going forward, unless legislation changes, which I don't think it will, when we come through the pavement project, we'll have to look at all the ADA, and we have a ADA specialty group down in central office that comes, they do field walks, they look and say, this is where crosswalks should be, and this is where we need a ramp. The design of the ramp, whether it's a fan ramp or you know a full ramp, um, crosswalks, and then we incorporate that into our design. So to jump now and do something without a project being driven by a pavement need, it has to be driven by a safety issue, a documented safety issue that, that we can say, okay, we got we to gotta spend safety money here because there's five fatalities on this intersection over the past Even 20 years. Even though we haven't had fatalities, you know, there, there have been incidents. And you know, Do you wait for a fatality before you, you make a move, or do you decide that this is a serious problem and needs to be corrected before something does happen. I mean, it seems that's that that's the kind of the situation we're in. We haven't had a fatality. We've been fortunate, but you know, you you watch people, young kids, uh, elderly, you know, handicapped people trying to get across the highway, and it's a, it's a struggle. And, and I'm not 100% familiar with Grand Marais. I've been up here many times, but it's been years. There are crosswalks safety at light signal systems. People need to use those until there's a safer way for them to cross. I mean. But that might be nine blocks away. Yeah. I mean, we have one, you know, we have one lane. There's only one lane right now. Is there only? There's one lane. We have one lane. And how many cross, or how many crosswalks, painted crosswalks are there? Legal ones? One. Yeah. We don't need that. Two. Two? Two. No, isn't it just one? Isn't it just? And then the light. light. So a total of three. I but think Broadway and First Avenue East are the only two yeah. legitimate crossings that have ADA compliance. Yeah. Oh, that have ADA yeah. compliance. Well, so I think that was ADA nice. compliance is, is something that's fairly new. But yeah, I'd be surprised if any of them had current ADA. <laughs> yeah, I would guess none of them do. <laughs> so to be, I mean, generously, let's say we have three okay. in a three mile span, approximately, from the New Gunflint to two miles span to this crosswalk at 8th Avenue yep. that has sidewalks on both sides. Not ADA. No, definitely not. I don't think no. any of them are. They're probably not because the ADA changed from, we put stuff in that's two years old that is no more 
the wire compliant. Mm -hmm. Well, you just at least have a curb cut. Mm -hmm. If you just say that you can get up it in a wheelchair. No, that doesn't count. <laughs> no, no, no. But no, I mean, I'm just saying, like, if, if oh, people in a wheelchair aren't going to be able to go anywhere but that intersection. The, the guess question is how many areas are there where there's a significant need for traffic to get across that has something marked to distinguish where that location is so that the motoring public and the, the pedestrian public know where they are. Yeah. Now, it's what the need is there. versus what's out there. I mean, you can go down in a rural area, there, there's restaurants down there, residents on the other side, there's a need to cross there. There's not going to be a sidewalk put in there. Um, you get into an urban area, the, it changes a little bit. Not every block do you want a crosswalk. You know, what's reasonable for people to walk? I mean, all that stuff needs to get into consideration. I would say, and I'm not the engineer that would do this, but if you got three, it sounds like maybe they're a little bit more condensed than what they they should be. Maybe you need to have three that are better spaced or better locations. Well, I mean, let, I, I would say one thing, just as a matter of education. A legal crosswalk does exist at every public street intersection. So from the standpoint of legality, there's a crosswalk of every, on, on every side of every intersection. The question of whether something gets striped or not is really an engineering determination. But well, we've, we've been told that we can't strike because we don't have an intersection that has, ADA. well, not ADA, ADA, but it doesn't have an intersecting street on the other side. So on the south side of the highway and the north side of the highway, the streets aren't always cre creating a, a, an, an intersection. But even if it's a T intersection, there is a legal crosswalk um, at each of those yeah. um, each of those sides of the, the intersection. So can we paint a couple of those? Well, I don't believe there's a place where you want to. You know, we we should take a step back from picking spots to paint tonight. Although I'm all for it, but we have we've done it before. Yeah, we've done it. That's what I mean. We've done it. But when right. we go through this design process, we're going to ask ourselves, what are we walking to? Why are we Why are we going there? How are we using it? And, and understand that before we understand, do we need a crosswalk? Or where do we want a crosswalk? Yeah. And I think we all kind of know intuitively, well, of course people are crossing at the bottom of Fifth because there's three restaurants and this and that, and they park there, and that's where they go. But I think it's also pretty useful to just kind of go through the whole exercise and understand it as a system before we try and figure out where do the crosswalks need to go. You know, from the standpoint of, 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 of legal crosswalks, where that becomes significant is from the standpoint of the motorized user. That the motorized user is required to yield to a pedestrian in the crosswalk. <coughs> and I just wish that more motorized users knew that a crosswalk legally existed at, at all public street intersections because if there's a, a pedestrian there, they're required by law to yield to them. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Just real quick so I understand the timeline. So if through this complete street, um, project, we identify that we want to have a sidewalk here or, you know, pick out this design. Do we have to wait then until 2020 or further until MnDOT has that on their scope or is there an ability to take action sooner than that? Well, I, um, Just so I know a timeline. I think that, like I said, what I would like to see in the end is an ability to, to chunk out smaller pieces sure. that we feel like we can just do. Yep and that we don't have to send through the whole funding mechanism. Okay. So it's, there's likely to be some of it that won't happen until MnDOT does a reconstruction project. Mm -hmm. But if there's some of it that we say, well, this is easy enough, we can afford to do it, we don't need to go get a grant, we can just do it, okay. then we'll, we'll still be working with MnDOT, but you know, if they don't have to come up with funding, it's probably easier for us to make it happen in a fast way. But then there's also gonna be some things where we say, well, we don't wanna wait for, to 2025 but this is a safety issue, or this is something that we want to make happen, so we're going to go look for a funding source. And then that's got a number of them, these have mentioned a few already, that, that address these outside of the driving lane sorts of issues. Okay. I think the yeah. difficult thing about doing things piecemeal, um, and Derek, you could probably speak to this better, is that you do need to know where you're going with this. You do need some sort of a design or a master plan. So that's the tough part. And any grant you would go for, you would want to be able to identify how that piece of the bigger picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And that's, I, yeah. I would recommend you take the whole thing, look at what the whole thing should be, and that might include realign some city streets that you know that could be very very expansive and it could be the acquisition of some property acquisition of some residences i mean you can get very large on this but the, you start big and then once you have a good concept see what you can do in the interim until that bigger concept comes through it, if the sims out grant process ever comes back you know, the city of Duluth got $3 million to, to do some bike lanes, sidewalk connections, um, rerouting some of their, their city streets to come in at a 90 degree angle rather than, and run a, with a cross street. Um, so some of those opportunities are out there. Safe routes to school can go a long way in, in potentially providing some kind of bike trail or, or sidewalk connections. Those are the type of things Brian Anderson would be able to direct you a lot more. And what grants would be the better route to go for different fixes? The grand big fix is probably something more than a safe routes to school or any of those other funding sources would be able to provide. But knowing that, have that ready for when another grant opportunity of a larger size comes about, you guys have something ready to go. Because yeah. some of those grants are a very tight time window and when you can apply for those grants. Sometimes it's not enough time to get CJ on board, come up with a grand design scheme, boom, the, the grant window's closed. Not that it would probably be wasted because that could always be there for future options, but you guys are being proactive and, and that's good. And I would encourage you to continue to be proactive, but be proactive on a grand scale too, would be my recommendation, because you never know when a special funding source is going to come out. I'd like to jump in on, just to go back just a moment to the safety piece too. And um, and we we work with, we work a little bit with Holly Kostrowski and Lieutenant Jason Hansen on the Toward Zero Death. Um, they've come up several times to our Safe Routes to School group, and we're getting, I think, it looks like we'll probably work a little bit more closely with them in the next year or two. Um, but we have, I would imagine, the, the traffic fatality and um, more, and more, what's the other one, injury reports. I would imagine that what they provided us is probably the same thing that you would go by. And you, if, if that's the case. probably got that from the same source. Yeah. So if that's the case, my recollection is that there isn't anything in Graham Ray, which doesn't mean there isn't a problem. It just means there haven't been reported accidents that resulted in vehicle damage or you know a, a, a legal report or um, a fatality thank goodness and there's not a bias um, against pedestrian traffic in that regard it's the same really with motor vehicle traffic and until there are actual crashes it's it's difficult to justify doing something sure so i just want to throw out that um you know we work with statewide we we work with pindot on conducting um, bike ped counts as you know citizens but we follow the mindot protocol and we in, we're inputting our data into the MnDOT's um, bike ped counting system um, for the city of Grand Marais. We're working; we've been working on that, and we're also um, just this week we installed in Grand Marais four different um, bike ped counter counters that are um, they're automated. They don't require a person there. So, and that's a pilot study between um, Greg Lindsay, who's a researcher at Humphrey School, and also MnDOT. And so, um, He's doing our bike lane research that I mentioned. Okay, yeah. yep. So he was just up on Monday and Tuesday and we were putting out these counters around town. So we, I mean, the city of Grand Marais with, in partnership with other local organizations and citizens is being really proactive about gathering objective data to be able to use because we know MnDOT operates on data. And so um, if, I guess what I'm trying to say is if there are ways that we can develop some kind of um, a speed study that, that we can do but meets your standards um, just to be a, a check for our process as well as feeding into your um, information. I can say that like our organization, Moving Matters with the clinic would be um, more than willing to do that. And, it's, and I, I think it's really important to have objective data, especially when we're looking at a design process, something of this scope that's going to be the timetable is going to be quite long, and we're, um, you know, if it act, if it gets built, it's going to be something that we all want to feel good about committing to for quite a few years. Um, so to me, I think it it makes sense that that would be based on some 
hard numbers, um, as well as our, all of our perception of what we feel when we're in that area as well. So if there's any way we can work together with you guys, Derek, um, at, in your office or Brian or whoever that might be to get to do some speed checks or you know whatever would be useful in the long run, we'd, we'd be happy to do that. Yeah, and if you continue to work on that towards zero death with Holly or Brian, um, that's a good start and, and continuing whatever we, information we can get from that. Yeah, and don't get me wrong for Minda, we don't want to have not only an unsafe area, but we don't want a perceived unsafe area. It's not that, uh, in order to use special safety funding, the requirements would need to be there that it's not just a perceived or potential safety thing. It would have to have some data behind it. Um, now, changing lane widths to try to add some traffic calming, um, and some of those aspects. Now, as I said, if, if we came through the mill and overlay to get rid of what's there now to, to do some changes, now we're, we're taking potentially a couple hundred thousand dollar project. Now we're adding ADA into it, so now we're adding a, probably a couple hundred more thousand to it. But when you do that and you gotta rechange some of your curb and gutter, now you're adding more. Well, when you change your curb and gutter, you really should update your storm sewer system that's there so now you're adding even more and if you're digging down to do that you look at your sanitary sewer you look at your uh, the gas water you look at all that stuff and now all that starts going on the city's bill to do and a lot of times the cities aren't able to react in a time that they can get money to fix all their utilities so i'm glad to see this this coordination and communications happening um, I hope someday that the, through some ways we can figure out a way that makes it feel as a safe, not only feel, but actually be a safer section of town. Um, now there's experts, and I'm not one of them, having to do with those parts of it, and I'm more than willing if, if our traffic department has been involved, that's why I'm gonna get involved again. You may get the same answer, you may get something different, I'm not sure, because I don't know what their answer was. The other time that you worked with them, you said they've been up here a few times, I believe, is what you said. Oh, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the, the safety thing is kind of a kind of a nebulous thing, and I guess I, would, I wouldn't discount too much the perceived safety. We have these different terms for safety that are substantive safe. Substantive, safety. nominal, mm -hmm. perceived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so what the discussion about the Mark Crosswalks, for instance, is really a discussion somewhat about people trying to get across the road to the coffee shop or to the whatever it is. And it maybe it doesn't feel safe because people are driving too fast or whatever it is. So there's lots of, there's like two sides or three or four sides to that safety coin. And again, part of that is the different contexts or the different zones. What do you want those places to be like? How fast is fast enough? And how can things be restriped, rearranged, whatever, to make it so that it works, works better as a whole? And, and the, um, gap, the gaps in sidewalks, maybe from one marked crosswalk to another one, and in between there might be a reason why people don't make their way to a crosswalk because I'm walking through a lawn or I'm walking through a mud puddle or I'm walking through something I don't know for sure, but I'm, I'm yes. guessing some of that is. <laughs> yes. And, and you, you yes. got you got half the people that might walk a block to a crosswalk, you got maybe 25% that might walk two blocks, you got another half the people that where they park is where they're crossing, doesn't matter if there's a crosswalk 50 feet away, they're gonna cross where they're gonna cross. Um, that's right. So you're always going to have the issue of somebody crossing in what's considered an unsafe situation. Um, I think a long way to go with everything would continue with this plan, look at how you want your sidewalks, how you want, I think there's some bike trail out there, I don't think it's the full length. Um, a multi-use pedestrian trail <clears throat> can sometimes be good rather than a sidewalk. 
and a bike lane on, on the highway. Maybe it's something that can be multi-use. has to be a little wider, I believe, for standard. Your you probably answered better than I. But those are the type of things that I, I want this group or whoever's going to be involved to look at and work through. Um, the best thing to do is have aerial photos and start drawing lines on stuff. And start very vague and then get another fresh copy and, and, and refine it. Um, it's a lot of kind of what we do as engineers when we start looking at, at a highway design. You know, we start with drawing some very vague lines sometimes and we start refining what those lines look like. Um, for a grant, we're, we're more than willing to help you in any way we can. Um, guidance, um, Brian will work with you on when certain grants come out, because maybe you're not aware of when they all come out. Um, Brian's very good at that. So as long as you keep communication with him, maybe there'd be funding some some way that comes up that we don't even know right now. But I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. That's not why I enjoy coming to these things. <laughs> have the collaborative to work together and do the best we can in, in, in the limited funding we have. And, hear from you what the needs are so when we do come through we you guys are prepared to let us know what your needs and wants are rather than us come here and then you start the process and then our design starts you come up with something well then either we got to step back and redesign what we're doing or you know delay our design until we know what kind of concept works best for the community um, being pro I thank you guys a lot for being proactive and thinking about this. Um, whoever put this together or started this concept um, deserves some a great gratitude. I mean, I appreciate it. I don't know if it was you, Mike, or if it was Brian, or if it was Brian is uh, mayor. We asked for something like this, and he, he organized this for us. And yeah. It's turned out terrific, guys. I really appreciate it. you know coming here. It, it is past four, however, and so you all made a really significant uh, investment of your time in this session. I don't want to ask you to spend any more time here uh, than you need to. If there was any more sort of final comments or questions that people had, uh, I guess we could take them now. Otherwise, I'm sure that people will be around here for a little bit longer. Just one wrap up. You're not the bearer of bad news. I think everything we've heard here today has been really positive and enlightening and I just want to thank you guys for coming. It's really yeah. helpful. Thank you. Just, just to add to that too, you know, I think the reason that the, the city is involved in this process and we think that, that a planning, planning process is important is that we've all identified that there are needs out there for that Highway 61 corridor, whether it's safety, whether it's uh, pedestrian or bicycle uh, traffic, whether it's the road speeds, uh, you know, all kinds of issues that are uh, hopefully going to be addressed and challenge will be with CJ to uh, try to uh, help us through this process, come up with something that, that we can utilize and can use for a long-term vision, but also utilize in order to solve some of these short-term problems too, because we know that there's, uh, there's some things that we, we should be addressing uh, in the very short term, not waiting until we can do a, a big fix uh, project. And another thing I, I would think about is, think about you know, this in different phases or different times, lengths of time. And the other thing that I always think about is, you know, what we thought maybe was kind of a crazy idea or not really acceptable two or three years ago. Um, you know, it's it's not so crazy anymore. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you've got some ideas that, you know, right now, you know, either MnDOT or somebody else thinks like, nah, it's just not gonna work, we can't do that. And maybe five years from now, which isn't actually that long when you get right down to it. It's kind of become something that's more acceptable. So, I mean, don't totally limit yourselves at, the, at this point. And, and the best way to do that, not only for um, people that have rollover positions, or, you know, document the decisions you made and why you decided to go one way or the other. And we try to do that our jobs and document why you're not doing something. Whether it just doesn't work or because it's such a harebrained idea right now, but 
if somebody goes back through five years from now and looks at it, they can look at stuff that was made and why, and maybe some of those reasons change. But it could put a spark in their mind on, oh, maybe we should think of this. Um, rather than somebody's coming over, seeing this, and then starting from scratch because they don't know why certain decisions may have been made at this time. So I don't know who might be the owner of that, that working document. Um, I'm assuming it would be the city um, or, or CJ at this point is, as long as he's staying involved. But uh, if CJ does as normal, you guys would be happy, at least with his concepts. All right. Thank you.